Oh, there you are. Hey. Okay, I hear you loud and clear. Good, coming through clearly. And uh, how, how about the visual? Uh, the visual, okay, is looking uh, pretty good. I'm ha um, I'm hang on a second, let me test. All right. Okay, that looks pretty good. Or, yeah, it's going to be a little bit dim because um, I don't have a really brightly lit place. But uh, but hopefully this is this will still work. Okay, I think it will work. Good. Okay. Uh, your mic may have to be turned down just a little. Um, how's my mic? Or I can I can talk more softly. Okay, I'm not sure I can, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, sort of shift over here now. Uh, just to uh, to greet people. Um, hi, Dolores, and hi, Kay. It's nice to see you both, that you are here. Please do some sharing for us. I won't be able to do uh, the usual sharing I do tonight, so um, help me out. Huh. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Okay, and you are at the In-Depth Show, of course, and tonight, uh, Robert C. Hockett, okay, and I, Professor Robert C. Hockett, okay, of the, uh, the, uh, the Cornell uh, uh, Law School. Um, but by the way, it just so happens that I have a bachelor's degree from Cornell. Oh, it's amazing, you know, how many great people turn out to have some sort of a Cornell connection, either undergraduate, or graduate school, or their parents uh, maybe met there in graduate school and they were born there, even though they didn't go to school there. Um, you'd be maybe you'd be surprised, maybe not. But um, it's, it's <laughs> not. To me. you know, once I you know when it, when it came to pass that I was going to be starting a new job over at Cornell, um, you know, told various friends and all, they said, "Oh my gosh, my parents met there and married there. Or oh, I spent my childhood there. Or oh, you know, I I was there as an undergraduate. You know, and you just sort of find out all sorts of." Wonderful people turn out to have some sort of Cornell connection. Uh, yeah, um, I got a BA in government there in 1960. It was a BA in what? I'm sorry. Okay, it was a BA with a major. Okay, in government. Oh right, right. So Ted Lowy would have been there, I suppose, back in 1960, right? Uh, yes, Ted Lowy was there, mm -hmm. and he was the chief guy on my committee. Ah, what do you know? On my honors committee. Oh, that's so great. So yeah, I arrived, you know, very well at the time. Okay. Uh -huh. Andy Hacker was also there. Mm -hmm. on the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Muller was there too. <laughs> right. The committee. Steve Muller became uh, the president of um, Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, uh, some years mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, uh, you know, later on, um, uh, when I was an undergraduate, which is sometime after you had left Cornell. Uh, I remember we used a textbook of Ted Lowy's, and, and so he was kind of a, a legend in my own sort of life. Um, and then when I started teaching uh, over Cornell about 15 years ago, he was still around, but emeritus. Um, but he, I got this email from him out of the blue uh, asking if I could join a dissertation committee that he was serving. Uh, looks like Robert uh, dropped off a bit. Not sure why, but... If he got in once, he should be able to get in again. I don't think uh, there's going to be a problem. Okay. In the meantime, if you could all help us out and share a bit, that would be a big help. And if you can be patient, because he undoubtedly will be back soon. Uh, I think he's coming in again. So I'll okay. yeah. uh, you, you were kind of fading in and out for me, and then I disappeared. So I just switched over to a different network. Maybe the signal will be stronger this way. Oh, good. Good. So, so you have a choice of networks where you are? Well, sort of. Um, I'm able to. I've got this sort of network that I can connect to through my phone. Um, and then I've got another one that's right here in the, in the apartment. And sometimes one is stronger than the other for some reason. So I'm guessing that 
this is one of those moments where the phone version is stronger. <laughs> so I've switched over to it because you, you were kind of fading in and out before as well. I was only, I was hearing you kind of intermittently, oh, I see. but you, you seem to be coming through quite clearly now and hopefully I am as well then for you. Oh, you are. You're coming in very clearly. And oh, terrific. Okay. I should have started with this in the first place. Um, but yeah, so what I was telling you was that, um, you know, so Ted Lowy was by this point emeritus, um, you know, 15 years ago when I started at Cornell, but he was still serving in a kind of ex officio capacity on somebody's dissertation committee. And he asked me if I could join. And I thought, my God, I mean, anything, anything for the legendary Ted Lowy. <laughs> I never dreamt, you know, because he was this, again, this kind of iconic figure when I was an undergraduate taking, you know, some government classes. And I never, I never dreamt I'd be at the same, you know, university with him, let alone serving on the same panel. But uh, anyway, as, as you'll remember, of course, from your student days, he's just a really, really sweet, lovely guy, you know. Yes, he, he was. He really was. Yeah. And he was great to me also. Yeah. Yeah. He was an honor student at the time. Mm hmm And, uh, I think not one of the best um, honor students. Okay. <laughs> and he took me under his wing. <laughs> he took me under his wing. And that That's was great it. for me. Yeah. I think, you know, most of us who have uh, done, you know, relatively well in life or at least satisfactory, yeah, satisfactory, oh, I'm sorry, satisfactorily in life. Um, have been, I think, probably rescued by one or more uh, mentors or um, mentor type type figures in our in our youth. Um, I'll you know I, I'll never forget the sort of uh, individualized tutoring I got from a second grade teacher in a course that I wasn't doing so well in because we had moved uh, from someplace that was sort of behind you know so I was way behind um, and so this wonderful teacher Ms. Granzen uh, took time uh, out of her own day uh, in the later afternoon to kind of catch me up or bring me up to speed. Uh, and it made all the difference in the world. It was it was only second grade, but uh, I'd probably still be in second grade if it hadn't been for her. <laughs> so. yeah, well, uh, the way that Ted uh, um, influenced me is that uh, I don't think I would have gone to graduate school. Oh, right. For him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He recommended that I go to graduate mm -hmm. school instead of going to law school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, okay, have ended up as a lawyer. <laughs> ah, yeah, you made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, it seems so um, at the time, but you got the best, okay, of both worlds, right? Okay, because you got a law degree and then you ended up teaching law too. Well, the, yeah, and I did, I actually did graduate work uh, before going to law school. Uh, law school was a bit of an afterthought, uh, came kind of late. I, I was a non-traditional uh, law student in the sense that I wasn't 22 years old or even 25 years old. Um, and indeed, I had rejected it and, and resisted it for a long time because my mom, uh, throughout my childhood, was always trying to tell me to become a lawyer. And I thought, well, that's about as good a reason as any I can think of to avoid that. Um, so, uh, particularly when she gave me the reasons, you know, the reasons that she told me that I should do it um, were not particularly. I mean, it was kind of like saying, do you know, you should do this because you're an asshole, um, and you <laughs> you look a really good asshole. You know? so I thought, all right, so I, I guess I'm going to avoid that. Um, but then later on, um, once I got into my 30s, very early 30s, I, I thought, you know. I was doing a lot of work with uh, homeless folk and I had, I had taken up residence with a bunch of homeless friends who lived under a bridge um, because I was sort of trying to figure out why they were homeless. And uh, it occurred to me fairly soon after I took up with them that having something, some form of vocational degree could actually be useful. I thought either a business degree or a law degree because I thought I could be more helpful to them, you know, rather than just studying them, so to speak. Um, so I started thinking about getting either uh, you know some kind of a business or finance degree or some kind of a law degree or maybe both. Um, and in the end, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up doing both of those things. And uh, I think it's actually why I teach in the areas that I teach in, because, you know, the, the two things that I kind of noticed most about life under the bridge were first, these guys didn't have any sort of banking access. Right. They didn't have access to banking services of any kind. And that seemed to play some role and they're not saving any money, even though they earn pretty good money every day. Uh, and so I started a bank for my friends. We called it the shoebox bank because oh. you know, people would just come up and they deposit money in little shoeboxes. And we would both initial, uh, you know, each depositor, so to speak, and I would initial a little ledger that we would keep in each shoebox. Uh, and a few of the guys actually managed to save up enough that way to pay union dues and to join the United Auto Workers 
and got some pretty good jobs in a, a, a at what was at that point a relatively new Ford Motor Company plant uh, out on the outskirts of Kansas City. Um, so that got me thinking a little bit about banking and financial services, and you know I'd never really thought about it before that there might be something like financial disenfranchisement or banking disenfranchisement. The other thing was that they had a kind of business form um, that I was participating in with them. Um, it was they were basically combining work and life, right? They they constituted a homeless camp, but they were also a business that washed and detailed cars. That's where the money came from that they would save in the shoeboxes. And it occurred to me they have a kind of kibbutz, right? Yeah, I had read about in the past in some utopian um, political arrangements type course, you know, on, on kibbutzim from the 50s. It sort of struck me that these guys had sort of rediscovered the idea of the kibbutz. And I thought, that's kind of interesting because it got me to sort of wondering, well, so you don't have to be Israeli to sort of be into kibbutzim. <laughs> Uh, I thought, why don't we have kibbutzim in America, right? And and that got me sort of a great of, idea, right? Yeah, so it got me kind of wondering about why we have the business forms that we do. So when I ended up going to uh, law school and then doing uh, graduate work in finance, it was you know partly about finance, banking, and the like, but then also partly about enterprise organization. You know why we have the kinds of enterprise uh, organizations that we have. Uh, and interestingly enough, to this very day, the two core courses, you know, we all teach seminars that where the subject changes from time to time and so forth. But we all also teach uh, certain sort of core curricula, uh, uh, curricular courses at the law school. Um, and my two are, on the one hand, financial institutions, which is sort of banking law plus other kinds of financial regulation, on, on the one hand, um, and then business organizations uh, on the other hand. So each of those corresponds to one of the big lessons that came from this time under the bridge with 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 my friends so but that's that's sort of the the weird tangled torturous story um pursuant to which i ended up becoming a lawyer um, before that i was doing my doctoral work was in mathematics and logic and i thought i was going to be some kind of a philosophy guy but you know at some point it occurred to me that that's just not useful <laughs> to anybody i mean i liked it you know and i seemed i seemed to do all right at it in the sense that you know i got you know the kind of the usual accolades from the the, the tutors and the, uh, the the higher ups, but it it just felt I just was constantly feeling guilty um, about doing it. So what I do now is I still do that kind of stuff, but I do it on the side, so that that way I don't feel like I'm you know I feel like it's a it's a, a leisure activity for me rather than my vocation, um, and my vocation is what I do. So in, in that sense, I think I you know I basically am more like you. I think than the typical lawyer might be because I didn't, you know, sort of go straight into law school. I guess so. Yeah. Yes, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what did you think about uh, the panel, the, panel? Uh, the round table? Yeah, I thought it was very, very interesting. I mean, it's it sort of um, the variety of different reactions, I thought, was sort of reflective of what might be maybe the most salient characteristic of the NIA proposal as Salai and I originally uh, developed it. Um, and by that, I mean that it it, it, it sort of meets uh, several distinct needs, right? There are a number of, of sort of, I think, I think we would say, I think there are a several sort of missing institutions uh, or several problems out there, both in, in thought about finance and in the practice of finance that Salai and I think, Salai and I both sort of lit upon uh, back around 2015 or so. Um, and we developed the NIA in a way as a means of kind of addressing all of those distinct lackings, right? All of those gaps. And in a sense, you could almost say that the different reactions to the proposal that you find in that symposium in the American Prospect, in a, in a sense, they kind of reflect the fact that the NIA is, is sort of addressing several distinct needs, uh, which was one of the one of the things that we thought was elegant about the proposal in the first place, was that a number of distinct things could be done sort of simultaneously by this one means. So to, to go back a little bit to sort of the backstory here and sort of what we were thinking, and, and I assume that Saleh still thinks along these lines. We haven't had the chance to talk about this for a while, but I, I think she's probably still thinking along these same lines. Uh, certainly I am. Um, back when we first started talking about this, about five years ago, we were working on what turned into a major paper uh, called um, a public, um, sorry, um, it was the, the subtitles more memorable, Toward a Developmental Finance State. 
I think it was public something in private something. I'm, I'm mixing it because we have two. We wrote two articles around the time that had very similar titles. But in any event, the basic idea um, with the development finance state is we were thinking, you know, we've kind of left development to accident, right? We've left development just to the the market, uh, yeah. and there's an awful lot um, of a sort of collective action that's required to make development proceed properly and functionally and continually. Um, and that was sort of one of the themes, I guess you could say, of that particular paper, that, that big article. And in the course of writing that article, um, we started sort of tentatively proposing various things that might be done to sort of realize what we were calling a developmental finance state uh, at the time. And one of them was what became the NIA, right? So we talked about how in the great sort of developmental past of the United States, um, those periods that had been characterized by smooth and steady and what we might call successful development always seemed to have at least, seemed to be partly driven by at least one, you know, sort of central public institution that played a critical role in the sort of planning and execution of what you might call a developmental strategy or development policy. One that we uh, that we hit pretty hard was was Alexander Hamilton's first bank of the United States, yes. which is right, which is, you know, had some of the attributes of a central bank in, in the sense that we think of central banks today. It issued, in effect, a circulating medium, a kind of national currency of sorts or a proto national currency. Uh, and it did uh, try to maintain a kind of price stability, you know, relative to that currency. And so those were sort of classic central banking type functions um, in a sort of early stage of development. But then in addition, uh, Hamilton's bank functioned or had some of the functions of a development bank, a development institution, because it was partly aimed at mobilizing what was otherwise scattered or diffuse capital and concentrating it and then training it on particular projects that had national development significance. Sure. In that sense, it was a bit like a, a national development bank. And it was in that sense, you could also think of it then as the sort of financial arm of the great Hamiltonian development program, right? Which as you know, was sort of multi-part, multifaceted. So we thought, okay, well, there's one interesting or important antecedent. Uh, and while we have recovered the old central banking function of Hamilton's bank in the form of the Fed, we have not uh, of late, uh, you know, recovered the development, the National Development Bank sort of function. Um, another institution that uh, I was totally obsessed with at the time and sort of was constantly talking up to Sally, probably to the point where I was sickening her, but then she got excited about it too, was of course the RFC, right? The Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Um, and the thing about the RFC was, of course, that it was, it's often referred to as the bank uh, of the New Deal, um, although it was also, for that matter, the bank of the Second World War mobilization. Um, and in, in, when it took on that role, it was sort of replicating the role of its own predecessor institution, which, of course, was the War Finance Corporation established uh, by during the Woodrow Wilson administration to sort of gear up for the First World War mobilization. But in any event, um, we thought that we saw in the RFC an interesting model to try to maybe develop a 21st century version of as well. Um, and the thing about the RFC was that there, there were a couple things that were interesting about it, right? But one of the, the interesting things was that it had such a broad and diversified portfolio of national investments that it accordingly developed a very broad array of modes of financing, right? So it made equity investments, it made loans, it guaranteed loans, uh, and then it also financed its own operations in a variety of ways, right? Starting with an initial congressional appropriation, of course, but then it was self-sustaining and profitable almost overnight. And then it was simply reinvesting, right, the returns on the previous investments that it had made. I'm not sure, do we have a, is there a feedback effect going on here, Joe? I don't know if there is. I'm not sure where, where it's coming from. It be coming from. Hang on a second. Let me sure. Sort of. Yeah, it sounds. It sounds like cicadas in August, which is a very comforting sound. Yes, uh, I, I'm also getting that, but I don't know where it would be coming from. Yeah, it seems to have died down. I don't have yeah. too many things open on my mm -hmm. system now. Yeah, I think I think you're the only thing I have on mine. But maybe it seems like it's 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 gone back down a bit. But in any event, so we sort of we one of the things we were thinking then was that you know what might be um, an intriguing prospect to sort of develop further 
would be a kind of 21st century version uh, of the RFC. Um, and so that's ultimately what became the NIA. And so the big NIA paper that we published in 2018, which is pretty major, I mean, I think it's like almost 100 pages long. It's a pretty long, full article. Um, it is, in a sense, the full development of this idea that we first kind of broached and sort of took, a, you know, took somewhat seriously um, in that development finance state uh, article uh, of ours. So, so getting back to the symposium then, um, when we started thinking about what the role of the NIA would be, when we asked ourselves what would a sort of contemporary version of the RFC do and look like, there were several sort of several functions we thought, right? One is we thought there ought to be at least some instrumentality of government yes. that, is, that is charged with thinking in terms of long-term national development something as a kind of never-ending um, process. I, I was, at the time, I kept calling it perpetual, um, and, and Sally thought that sounded too pretentious or something, but but basically we were, we were always looking for synonyms for, for, for what I wanted to call perpetual. So sometimes we say ongoing, sometimes we say continuous, but basically continuous or ongoing or perpetual development. The thought here being that it's a mistake and, and actually a kind of a major intellectual blunder of uh, sort of, let's say, second half of the 20th century economics to think of development as something that's like a one-off achievement, right? You're undeveloped and then you, you know, you follow Walt Rothstau's recommendations and then suddenly you're developed <laughs> and that's it. Right. Um, and well, I was course, always, uh, the, uh, the right wing here yeah. has been extremely opposed to any kind of industrial policy. Right. In yeah. The United States over a period of time. Yeah. And I notice sometimes, uh, you can or others, um, um, have used uh, that particular term, uh, but that you use it very sparingly. Right. Uh, because it's sort of like uh, waving a red flag in front of the bull. Yeah, it's funny. It's a lot of there are a lot of terms that are kind of like that, right? They they've become loaded or freighted over yes. the over the ages yes. with connotations that you know maybe you don't want to put before people's eyes right away. Not because you want to sort of hide anything from them, but because you want to sort of preempt their throwing up blinders, right? Because yeah. that seems to be the way the human mind works, at least for a lot of people, is if a word or a phrase is especially familiar to you and you have all these Pavlovian associations in your head between that word or phrase and a bunch of other stuff, then it's very hard for somebody later to use that same word or phrase in a different way that, you know, then doesn't. So I think a lot of people, when they hear, I, I myself, actually, I think Sally and I both are like this. I think we're both perfectly comfortable with the phrase industrial policy and are quite happy with it. Uh, but I also think we both recognize that a sizable number of people out there think of, I don't know, 1970s British state-owned industry, you know, sort of pre-Thatcherite Britain, where people, you know, there's this kind of ugly uh, set of associations that people have in their heads with sort of inefficient well, British. They either think of that or they think of uh, communism. Or that too, I suppose, right? Gosplan or just any, you know, some kind of totally planned economy. Uh, and our, you know, and our thought is, I think, again, I think I'm speaking for both of us when I say this, and I, I know I'm certainly speaking for myself, is that it's sort of a mistake, sort of just like it's a mistake to think of development as something that, you know, first you're not that and then you are that and then it's all over. It's, it, right, it's similarly a mistake to think that an economy is either planned or unplanned, right? It's it's always a matter of degrees of planning, right? I mean, even our economy as it currently stands, even, you know, with the Trump administration in place is planned in particular ways, right? And then furthermore, it probably bears noting that even the so-called private sector is a kind of planned economy. It's just that it's, you know, venture capital funds or other private sector ent entities that are doing the planning. In other words, non-democratically accountable uh, entities yeah. that are doing the planning. Right? So it, it's, it's kind of weird already that we think of planning as simply, a, you know, something that is only done by the public sector uh, or object, you know, potentially objectionable planning is something that's only done by the public sector. But it's also weird to think in terms of uh, to think of planning as something that's either entirely planned or entirely unplanned, you know, and and I think our thought has been, and certainly mine remains, and I imagine I think Sally's probably does as well. It's that, you know, the the real the question isn't whether it's unplanned or planned. The question, one of the questions, is how planned, you know, to what you know, and what how far in the direction of planning do you go? And then secondly what actually do you focus the planning on and what do you leave then to private initiative and so forth, right? Yeah. Uh, and it seems pretty clear that certain basic public infrastructures 
if they're going to be usable uh, by private sector entities, and if they're going to enable private sector entities to flourish and to create and to invent and so forth, do have to be not only publicly supplied, but publicly planned. You know, what would be the point of providing things if you didn't plan for the provision, right? I mean, it's not like you're gonna do it on the fly, so to speak, right? So our thought was, you know, there, there's a function, there's a legitimate function to be performed um, by some instrumentality of the public that you can think of broadly speaking as developing kind of long-term development strategy, right? Some kind of a long-term vision for what kind of economy we want ours to be and where we want it to sort of grow faster or develop more and where we might like to see it kind of phase out or die out, right? Um, so to use a, a salient contemporary example, I think most people would agree that uh, the sooner that fossil fuel usage dies out, the better, as long as there will be. Right, yeah, as long as there's some replacement, right? And the only, I think even, even right wingers probably get that. It's just that they always react because they think what we're talking about is just eliminating it before there's a replacement. But nobody's advocating that, or at least very few people, um, I think, are actually advocating taking you know, put, getting you know, taking the axe to uh, to fossil fuels before there's any sort of replacement. We'll just ride horses in the meantime and wear buckskin or something. I don't think anybody's advocating that. Um, but in any event, um, so you know, if, if you think in broad terms like that, you know, in the long term, would it be better to have renewable energy as our principal energy sources, or you know, still keep burning shit like we've been doing since you know twenty five thousand years ago, or since the advent of the human species, you know? Are still burning stuff, right? I mean, I think most people would agree it's sort of embarrassing. It's actually kind of it kind of sucks, right? That we still burn stuff in order to produce energy, right? Suck. We, we we were doing that in caves when we were wearing animal skins, you know. So I think most people would agree that you know it would be kind of you know a, a bit more befitting the dignity of the human animal that has evolved over hundreds <laughs> over tens of hundreds of thousands of years, actually to be able to harness energy that's coming from the sun or kinetic energy that you know, takes the form of water falling and, and so forth, um, rather than just continually burning stuff. And the real question is, all right, how do we get there? And are there are there faster ways? Are there slower ways? And I don't think anybody in their right mind would say, well, we should just kind of do it blind. We should just fly blind in that direction, right? It requires some kind of deliberative planning. Um, and if we're thinking in terms of the, the full economy that we want all private sector firms and industries to be able to use, then of course we're thinking of some kind of public action, right? So one of the functions that we were thinking of the NIA as performing as sort of it basically assigning it that task of sort of developing and then regularly updating a kind of long-term national development strategy that you could then develop specific investment plans and then portfolios of such plans in keeping with, right? Or in, in harmony with. And in that sense, you've already got, you can, you can sort of say that in the way we were thinking of the NIA, you've already got two distinct functions here now. On the one hand, there's the planning or the strategy development. And then on the other hand, there's the execution. And of course the execution requires financing Yes. And different forms of financing would seem to be preferable for different kinds of project, right? Some will lend themselves to lots of private sector involvement alongside public sector involvement. Others might have to be almost entirely or maybe altogether entirely public. Others can be, you know, in other cases, the pri you know, private sector actors can be given or allowed a larger role. And the thought would be that when it comes to the execution function, your, the development of the portfolio of the NIA, or maybe more specifically of its two distinct branches, right, the NIB and the NICI Mac, um, then that's where you're getting a little bit more detailed. And that now you're getting sort of more project by project, or at least project type by project type. Um, and that is obviously a very closely related function to the long-term strategic planning and the development of a strategic plan function. It's closely related to it, the two go together kind of hand in glove, or in the same way that I guess forming an intention on the one hand and acting on an intention on the other hand are closely related, but they're also, of course, analytically distinct. Um, and I think some some people's reactions, I think, to the NIA uh, proposal might stem from that fact, right? The very fact that we've already got those two functions combined, right? Um, but of course, it gets even more complex than, than, than that, right? So 
for example, since we put out the original NIA uh, paper, it was actually about six months after, ironically, about six months after we published the big NIA paper, which came out in the spring or summer, I believe, of 2018, um, the Green New Deal came along, right? People began talking about the Green New Deal that autumn um, after, and again, the, I think that our, our article came out in the spring or summer, early summer, maybe of 2018. So within, let's say, four to six months of the articles being published, the Green New Deal sort of got onto the horizon and, and, and it really rapidly took over public consciousness to the point where everybody was talking about it. And then at the point where I was help, helping to draft the Green New Deal resolution uh, for AOC and for uh, Senator Markey. So now all of a sudden, all of our heads were being filled with that. And that, of course, leads naturally toward people to people's thinking in terms of like a green bank or a, a green infrastructure bank or just a plain old infrastructure bank. And as you know, people have been talking about infrastructure banks for quite a while, especially sure. you know in a big way, starting around 2009, 2010. And of course, that community, people who are talking about infrastructure banks were bound to be, they're, they're obviously in a, in a space adjacent to that of the NIA. And there's even, of course, some overlap. And then when you get the sort of the more specialized form of infrastructure bank, like a green infrastructure bank, then the question arises, all right, is this something that's kind of separate from and would operate in parallel with the NIA? Because the NIA is a much more permanent sort of thing as we were conceiving it. Or is it something that would be handed over to the NIA, where the NIA itself would, would handle it as part of its broad portfolio of responsibilities? Um, and I don't know that there's any one single answer that's the right answer to that. It seems to me that the answer to that one really just depends on what's politically feasible or politically expedient at a given moment in time, right? In other words, you could imagine if there was a lot of public um, I'll stop for just a second as that sound dies down. Uh, yeah, and again, I don't know what's causing this. It seems like when I stop talking, it slowly goes back down. So maybe, yeah, there we are. So, so um, yeah, maybe there's feedback coming from me. But um, in any event, you can imagine a, a couple of scenarios, right, that I can imagine. Imagine two scenarios that operate in a kind of temporally reverse fashion. You might have, you could imagine the following happening. Let's say that um, there had been no COVID pandemic, um, uh, but everybody realized that, yeah, we need to do something about green infrastructure to sort of facilitate the sort of um, the actual sort of elaboration of or the, the realization of the Green New Deal. So let's say you could then get a lot of con con Congress members, or at least sufficiently many of them, to get behind a green infrastructure bank proposal. And then that is instituted, it's up and running, it's working really well, and then COVID comes along. And then people say, holy crap, you know, we really need to mobilize production of N95 masks, we need to mobilize production of respiratory ventilators, we've got to sort of take charge of our own supply chains again, instead of depending on global supply chains, including China. Um, we need something kind of like this thing that Hockett and Omarova were calling an NIA, hey, I know, why don't we just expand this green infrastructure bank into a bigger, broader thing with a larger mission? Sure, sure. You, you can imagine that being a politically uh, sort of uh, frictionless or at least minimally frictious uh, uh, way of going. Imagine the other way. You could also imagine things happening in the other direction. Imagine COVID comes along first. Uh, we say, holy crap, we need to sort of take charge of, again, mobilizing production of certain things. This is a bit like the war. It's a bit like Pearl Harbor. Uh, we formed a war production board at that time. And of course, the uh, RFC was, in a sense, subordinated to the war production board once the Second World War came. So now we took the planning function and put that in the war production board. And now the RFC was simply the executor, as it were, simply the financial arm, in effect, of the WPB. Yeah. Um, that's the way things. That's the way things kind of developed or morphed once that war started. You can imagine a similar thing happening uh, if we had started with COVID before there was a Green New Deal. You might say, oh, we need something like a war production board for medical equipment and, and, and vaccine production and so forth. Um, and, you know, this, uh, Hockett and Omarova have been talking about this NIA thing. Maybe we need like an NIA for this purpose or maybe a slightly more narrow purpose one like the one that Jamie Galbraith and Mike Lind proposed that was a, they called it a health finance corporation, an HFC patterned after the RFC, but focused on health. 
you can imagine somebody, you know, we, we, we might, you can imagine Congress going for that. And then maybe a couple of years later, oh my God, the planet's burning. We really need more green infrastructure investment. Hey, how about we use this uh, Hakkad Omarova NIA thing? How about we give, you know, add to its portfolio green infrastructure investment or something like that? You can imagine that happening. And then again, you can imagine there being simply two distinct institutions that are founded either at the same time or at different times that simply have different missions, right? The Green Infrastructure Bank is just really focused on the green infrastructure and the NIA is a much more sort of plenary sort of mission. It's just sort of, again, ongoing national development across lots of different spheres. My own thought is that there's not like one conceptually best answer to that question. It almost seems to me that how you do that configuring is inevitably going to be something of an accident of history and something of an accident of just you know, what is most salient on people's minds at given times, right? And again, you sort of see that in connection with the history of the RFC itself, because it's, it's, its own mission morphed significantly over its 12 or so year history, right? It started out simply as something to recapitalize the banks. It was a pretty, pretty narrow mission to begin with. It started out in uh, 1932. 32, yeah. It was actually started by, uh, it was kind of, this is one of the things I love. Yeah, I always love talking about, I always call it the Hoover Roosevelt RFC, yeah, simply as a way of driving home the point that it was kind of bipartisan in that sense. And it's not an accident that Hoover started it up because Hoover was the brain behind the WFC, which was the predecessor, right? Yes, as you'll, as, you know, as you'll remember from your political science days and, and your history reading, Hoover before he became a stodgy, you know, kind of timid Republican who just couldn't quite handle the Great Depression, was a progressive, a very progressive, um, <laughs> very creative, innovative thinker, and a very energetic and lively thinker um, back in the teens and even in the up into the early twenties. Um, and one of his great brain children, so to speak, was precisely the WFC, which, again, kind of just in the same way the RFC had a war production board as a kind of coordinate institution, so did the WFC have a war industries board, or WIB, as a co in a coordinated role, uh, or as a coordinate institution. Um, and so the idea was that WIB, you know, did the war planning to gear up for the First World War. And then, of course, the WFC was the financing arm of that board. So um, when uh, the Great Depression strikes uh, and Hoover is sort of trying to figure out what to do, various people start begging and saying, bring back the WFC, which ironically had only wound down a couple of years before because they didn't just immediately end it after the First World War. It kind of wound down gradually over the 20s. And I think it was finally done. I think it finally wound down in maybe 1928 or so, maybe maybe 29 even. Um, and so people said, well, remember that WFC thing, President Hoover, that you invented and that was how still- you bring it back? Yeah, how about you bring it back? Um, and so it's he was- Great like, for now. <laughs> yeah. So they just sort of reinstituted it, but now as a reconstruction finance corporation. Uh, and, um, you know, so it, it had a sort of similarly narrow mission to begin with in the way that the WFC had been kind of war focused. But then it gradually grew, especially, of course, once um, <coughs> Roosevelt took office. I sometimes laugh. I tell people that, you know, basically there are two halves to the to the New Deal, the original New Deal. One half of it was all New York State programs that Governor Roosevelt and his uh, state industrial commissioner, Francis Perkins, developed during the gubernatorial period. And then when he goes, and she was like the smartest person who ever worked for him. And then they moved to DC when he becomes president and she becomes his labor secretary there, but basically just has the same role at the federal level that she had had at the state level in New York. So she becomes, of course, the first woman cabinet member ever in a presidential administration, secretary of labor. but. Her mandate was much more than just labor, you know, she, so social security came from a New York system that they had developed. Yes. Anyway, so half of the, half of the stuff that uh, was the new deal was basically just New York expanded. And the other half was Herbert Hoover expanded. That's because <laughs> Herbert Hoover had like all these fantastic ideas, even when he was president. But the problem is that he was just timid about them. He always does them with like too little, too late, like small scale. So then Roosevelt, you know, big bounteous, you know, kind of big thinking, you know, kind of a man who's sort of larger than life comes and says, that looks like an excellent idea. Why don't we make it 10 times bigger? And he yeah, just sort of- was so charming. He was right, so totally charming. Confidence. 
yeah, just beaming with confidence. He just knew what to do, right? And and he and he was not afraid to call an idea a good idea just because somebody else had come up with it, or especially even a Republican like Herbert Hoover. So he just says, you know, this RFC thing is fantastic, but why does it only have you know twenty five dollars or whatever? <laughs> and so they 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 expanded it enormously in terms of the size of the portfolio. And, but but first, the range of projects was still kind of narrow. Again, kind of recapitalizing banks to begin with, because it was an it was the, the first use to which uh, FDR put it was basically to deal with all the bank failures, all the closing banks. Right? It, it sort of grew out of the bank holiday, which, as you know, he he declared right after taking office in March. No, the first thing he did was declare a bank. Yeah, it was the very first thing, right? So it's not surprising, right? He does that, that back then you were inaugurated in March. And so the first thing he does is declare the holiday in March of 33. And it's not surprising that then the first sort of expansion of the RFC's mandate that he takes on is to say, well, let's use this thing to recapitalize these banks so we can reopen them. But then when that works, right, then they broaden it out further. Hey, let's invest in this. Let's invest in that. Let's rescue that industry. Let's rescue this industry. And little by little. Here's a question, okay, at that point. Yeah. Uh, why didn't he use the Fed to recapitalize the banks? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think at the time, I mean, he could have done that. But I think the thought at the time, they had already come by this point to think in a certain way about the Fed, which has been the way we thought about it ever since, which, by the way, in a separate project, I'm trying to change. Um, but, you know, basically, but, you know, as you know, I've been behind this spread the Fed project and the idea is to sort of bring the Fed back into line with what was originally envisaged toward in 1913. But leaving that to one side for the moment, um, the reason that that's necessary, well, Let's say this: the reason that it's necessary to, to you know, reintroduce this spread the Fed idea is precisely the fact that we have a particularly cramped conception of what the Fed's role is now, relative to what was originally envisaged for it. And the answer to your question, I think, is that this cramped vision of what the Fed is for had already begun to set in by the 1930s. There was a significant train of thought that had it that the Fed should basically have a very simple and very sort of narrow mandate which is basically to maintain price stability by controlling the money supply. And that it shouldn't, and when it comes to extraordinary actions like recapitalizing banks or rescuing banks, that should be, since it's extraordinary and, and sort of ad hoc in that sense, we should uh, have some other institution whose specialty is ad hoc rescue do that, right? You know, the, you know, the ambulance institution, in other words, will do that, you know, the paramedic institution. And I think the RFC was seen from the start, and this is actually one thing that distinguishes it from Salah's and, and, and my vision of the NIA, is that the RFC itself was viewed, even at the time, as a kind of paramedic institution, right? It was viewed, I mean, you can see it even in the name, right? Reconstruction, right? Like, okay, once you've reconstructed, I guess we don't need you anymore, right? You've reconstructed. Um, it's interesting, by the way, when you look at the, the actual technical name of the World Bank that was established after the Second World War, the official name is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, right? And it was originally th thought of as a, a, an RFC for Europe, right? It was, it was patterned partly after the RFC itself. And the idea was that Europe needs to be reconstructed, right? And so, but then the Marshall Plan sidelined that, re that reconstruction uh, mandate of the World Bank. So they basically focused on the development instead. And so it became a kind of third world oriented, as they called it back then, a third world oriented institution. But in any event, I think that the RFC was largely seen as a kind of an ad hoc thing, like we'll keep it for as long as we need it, but we'll eventually wind it down. And I think Salah and I are probably agreed that that was a mistake. It was a mistake to think of it as temporary. It made more sense, and it does make more sense even now, to think of it as filling a particular need that's always there. Uh, at least insofar as we continue to think of the Fed in narrow terms, right? If we keep thinking of the Fed as having a very simple, straightforward, you know, kind of univocal mandate that is that is sort of amenable to technocratic management, namely price stability or full employment as consistent with or high employment as consistent with price stability. If we think of the Fed that way, then we need something, some institution that's kind of thinking in terms of long-term national development is something that's never done. I some, you'll get a kick out of this, Joe. I sometimes say that my favorite development economist is a guy named Robert Zimmerman, uh, better known, of course, as Bob Dylan. Uh, because, 
<laughs> you'll remember the line from uh, It's All Right, Ma, where he says, you know, he not busy being born is busy dying. Um, it seems to me that's true of countries, right? That basically if your economy or your technological base or your productive capacities are not continually being born, then they're busy dying, right? And that's right. It's, right? it's a fallacy to think that uh, we have a situation where a country, okay, is underdeveloped. Yeah. And then it gets to be developed. Yeah. And that's it. It's, and it's, it's all over. Yeah, there you, you, you've arrived. You've arrived. You're there. Here it is, right? And we haven't internalized uh, the lessons yet that exactly. have gradually been killing different areas of our country. Yeah. Globalization, okay, and international trade. Exactly. And now we have huge portions of our country which are de-developed. Yes. And yeah. which we have to redevelop. Yeah, and now they are kind of so-called third world type regions, right? To use the language of the 70s or 80s, you know. Um, and even if we redevelop them, it will still be the case that then there will be other areas that exactly. are getting de-developed. And yeah. that's why we need a permanent function like the NIA. Precisely. It's never done, right? It's never finished because the country is perpetual, right? I mean, in the sense that it's almost as though we've projected onto the country the idea of an individual lifespan, right? And so we, of course, in our individual lives, you know, we start out in childhood, we, we enter into adulthood, we get educated, we get our final degrees sometime in our 20s or 30s, and then we're developed, and now we just do what we do, right? And we don't, we don't continue to develop. That's probably a mistake, even in the case of an individual life. Many people, I think, would agree with that. But it's especially the case in an overlapping generation's polity that just continues on and on and on. You can't say, oh, it developed. It was a child, and then it became a teenager, and then it became a young adult, and now it's middle-aged, and it could just coast. It's con it has to be constantly remaking itself. Uh, because technology itself doesn't stand still. So why would the developmental state of your economy stand still, right? So it, it, that, that has to be a permanent function. And I think one reason that Sally and I were drawn to the idea <clears throat> of the NIA is we thought, if you think about it, the two principal public finance organs that we have are, of course, the Treasury on the one hand and the Fed on the other. Yeah. And so, right? And one way to distinguish them is to say, that insofar as the Fed has a narrowly construed mandate, a fairly simple task of just maintaining price stability, then again, it's a fairly easy, simple thing to do. Uh, you can pretty much leave it to technocrats to do it, and you can leave it pretty independent, uh, you know, away from the democratic process in the sense that you you give very long terms to Federal Reserve Board governors and so forth. Basically, because there's not that much politics that has to be involved, at least in the more technical stuff that it does, or at least that's the sort of idealized version I think that some people have of the Fed of its proper role. We have the idealized version, but wasn't or shouldn't have that been changed by uh, the passage of the Fed Act of uh, I guess it was 1978. Oh, the Humphrey Hawkins Act. Yeah, Humphrey. yeah, yeah. In some ways, it did, but but not much, right? Because it simply added one additional mandate, right? So now we talk about a dual. It added um, additional mandate, which has been largely ignored by. Largely the ignored, yeah. And and again, I think that's I, th I think that's a mistaken view of the Fed, which is part of what the whole spread the Fed thing is all about. But um, but leaving that aside for the moment, I think one of the ways that one of the ways that Sally and I were thinking is we were thinking, okay, if people are going to think of the Fed that way. And if they're going to treat the Fed that way, well, then the Fed is basically the kind of, you know, the least political organ. Yes. The Treasury, on the other hand, is the most political because it basically has to allocate on an annual basis. You know, there's an annual budget every year. So it's constantly picking winners and losers. And we've sort of, you know, we that's what it's for, right? And we thought, well, there's a kind of middle ground between the kind of, you know, annual changes, picking winners and losers, coming up with new allocations every year or every few months or whatever on the one hand, and the, oh, we're not allocative at all, we're just maintaining price stability extreme on the other hand. In the middle, there's a realm where you have to allocate, but you have to be doing long-term allocation, not annual appropriations style allocation. And one way to think of the whole idea of a sort of a national development strategy that the NIA would develop and execute on was it something that would therefore be kind of midway between, and we often describe it as sort of operationally situated midway between the Fed and the Treasury, at least on those idealized conceptions of the Fed and the Treasury. So 
Fed supposedly not allocative at all, just modulatory. Treasury pure allocative, even to the point of just like allocating all the time, you know, and so it's always sub subject to the political rough and tumble. And I thought was there's some allocations that need more stability than that. And so they have to be somewhat more technocratic than treasury style allocation, but they also have to be much more forthrightly allocative than what the Fed is ever comfortable with admitting it's doing, right? And the Fed will never admit that it's allocating, even though of course it is. But we thought there has to be at least one institution between those two that is overtly and forthrightly allocating, but in a, in a kind of not as, as in as non-political or in, in as politically neutral a way as possible by basically focusing on long-term public investment projects, infrastructure projects that would benefit everybody. And as long as the portfolio covers the entire country so that you've got infrastructure redevelopment or renewal going on in every sector of the country all the time, then it's not really allocating in the kind of controversial sense, right? And you so, hope. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, that would be the hope, right? And that but was- actually, hope, But in a certain sense, that is the most political um, allocation okay, of all because it, it sets the course of the country. Right, it yeah. The trends, it creates the pattern. Yes. In that sense, it's clearly very political, right? Because it's it's kind of a polity's way of deciding what it's going to be. You know what I mean? It's choosing its own identity in the future, right? In that sense, it's very political. But the sense in which it's less political, I think the way, at least as we were thinking, is that, you know, we, we often think about allocation decisions made by Congress with its appropriations and then it's executed by Treasury as sort of, you know, basically, oh, we're giving this stop or this benefit to the oil industry or we're giving this benefit to this particular industry. And it's all kind of, you know, uh, it's all sort of corrupt in a sense. You're sort of helping out your particular, your big donors or whatever. And in that sense, there's a real clear winners and losers kind of aspect to it. Um, but we were thinking there are some allocative decisions that you can make if you think of them as full portfolios of decisions that don't have to have winners and losers, at least in macro, as a, you know, in, in aggregate, right? So if you have a portfolio that, you know, allocates money toward this project on the one hand, which is benefiting the Alaskans, let's say, or the, or the, the Vermonters, but then you've also got this project that's benefiting the Oklahomans, and basically there's something for everybody in it, kind of like the New Deal itself did, because it had projects going on in every district of the country, then it's not political in that in quite the same sense because it's it's sort of again there's like something for everybody right and our thought was that um at least i think this is both of our thought and certainly it, it certainly continues to be mine and i assume it still continues to be sally's is that there is a realm of allocation that is sort of longer term allocation rather than just you know annually changed or annually redetermined allocation of the kind that you find in the congressional appropriations process and you need that because some projects just require lengthy periods of time to come to fruition and then of course to yield their various benefits right and so we thought this means that it would have to combine and in some ways it would be fed reminiscent and in other ways it would be treasury reminiscent and that's why we thought of it as being sort of operationally situated between those two and insofar as there is a gap between those two we thought it's a it's a it's a lacuna right it's a it's a missing institution that yes, it's a way of filling that gap. Yeah, precisely. And that was the thought. And so that you was know, a very good way to think about it. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you I, I'm glad you see the compellingness too, Joe. I mean, it seemed to us so it is very it is it's very compelling to have mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. especially the case uh, since Congress seems to have such difficulty in doing allocations on a year by year basis. Exactly. Yeah. Our political system. Mm -hmm. need, uh, something else to keep going. Mm -hmm. It would be too much, perhaps, to expect that once a generation, Congress uh, would be able to decide on a pattern or give mm -hmm. direction to a pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But after that, if it's, we need something to continue driving that pattern. Mm -hmm. If the day-to-day -day conflicts in Congress are likely to weaken the commitment. Precisely. Yeah. Oh, we can't afford to have a weakening of the commitment because that just mm -hmm. destroys the coherence of the whole thing. Exactly. We don't get anything accomplished. Yeah, beautifully put. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there, there are plenty of allocations or allocative uh, tasks 
that are legitimately viewable as sort of short-term allocative tasks. And, and then it's, so it's fine with those, Congress can, you know, kind of change those allocations every year, no big deal. But when we're talking about something that's meant to be like the, the kind of the, the macroeconomic equivalent of a durable good, that is to mm -hmm. say a kind of infrastructure that remains in use for many decades and that basically makes it possible for private sector institutions or firms to be more productive than they otherwise could, well, then you, you, you need a certain degree of stability in that investment behavior. You can't have that too subject to sort of political whims. You want it to be democratically accountable, of course, but you don't want it to be subject to sort of sudden or instantaneous changes or whims. And, and, and to use your word, there has to be more commitment in a sense behind those particular investments. And so it seemed to me that it seemed to us that that was exactly uh, the kind of gap that the NIA would, would fill. Now, I think we were also, we were sort of of two minds in a way. I don't, I didn't, we, we, we didn't end up having to decide one way or the other, but there's sort of two ways to think of that characterization of the NIA then. One is as a function, which could be performed by then one institution that you call the NIA, or might be performed by several institutions that kind of combine together to discharge those functions. And another is to think of it in terms of an actual literal, literal institution that we're actually blueprinting, that it would actually take the very form. Um, and I think we, we, we thought that it's probably simplest to think of it in the latter way, to think of it as a particular institution, at least insofar as you don't have to, you know, if you're not confronted with any need uh, to sort of separate between the function on the one hand and a particular inst instantiation of the function on the other, We'll just think it, of it. it would be just confusing to people. Yeah, that would be confusing. So we'll just think of it in concrete terms. And so, in the big 2018 paper, um, we went into great, you know, painstaking detail uh, as to sort of what we thought the, the the total, the full number of decision points, so to speak, would be. Right? What would the thing? What would be the things that would have to be decided on? And then also, what are what are the most plausible looking options? What are the most plausible menus? for each decision point, so to speak, you know? Uh, so when it comes to like, for example, the governance structure, should it look more like the Fed? Should we should we have a governance structure more like that of the Fed? Should we try something a little different from that? Should we have regional NIA offices, sort of by analogy to the Federal Reserve District Banks, or should it be, op should it be structured differently? And we, we try to lay out various options along all of those particular dimensions, but always um, on the assumption that there would be this, this one institution that would be the upshot of all of those choices, right? And that's still the simplest way to think of it. Uh, and so it's easiest in a way to think of the NIA that way. But one thing I think that recent, the last couple of years have presented us with as a, is at least the possibility that it might be easier to get the functions discharged by two or three institutions rather than by one. Uh, and it just, again, it kind of, it, there it just sort of depends, I think, on where the politics end up going, right? If you can get a bunch of Congress members, for example, to get behind a green, a so-called green bank, uh, which as you know, a lot of Congress members are behind, but you can't get anybody behind a kind of plenary, an institution with a kind of plenary jurisdiction or a plenary agenda like the NIA itself, then you can imagine starting off with a green bank and then gradually expanding its 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 portfolio, sort of in the way that Roosevelt himself did with the RFC. Because again, to repeat, when he first inherited the RFC, it was rather narrower. It wasn't a green bank, but it was basically a bank recapitalizing bank, you know. And then it just gradually grew. It morphed into something bigger and more complex. And so you can imagine, at least I can imagine, um, starting with something with a somewhat narrower mandate to begin with, just in order to get it on the table, just to get Congress to put it into place, and then pushing for it gradually to expand. That might be an easier sell. But in the alternative, maybe uh, it would be easier to start with the full NIA and just say, oh, that will handle also the green investment. And that's something I'm just sort of agnostic about that. I think it really just it's hard to tell in advance because we really don't know what congressional reactions are going to be. You know, it seems to me at this point. Yeah. It's, so you're really saying it's how it goes is really going to be dependent on the politics. Yeah, I think largely. Right. And and I think in that sense, I think my my own inclination is to is to sort of take a, a two a sort of a, a, a two aspected posture. Right. On the one hand, advocate what you think would be the very best, right? The optimal thing. 
while at the same time being willing to, you know, maybe settle for something a little bit different if it looks like the thing that's a little bit different could easily be grown into or morphed into the genuine article, right? right. But that, if yeah. you, you could settle on a green bank, mm -hmm. uh, a green capital management uh, mm -hmm. corporation, mm -hmm. okay, um, under a green investment authority, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you could have something that would be structurally similar to the NIA idea. Precisely. And, yeah. sit and wait for people um, in the Congress to expand uh, the scope of it as mm -hmm. well problems present themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. exactly and so i think you know i don't i think it'd be a mistake to rule that out then in any kind of categorical sense the 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 dilemma that it raises of course is you don't want to sort of preempt you, you don't want to do the, the old obama thing where you know he compromise he compromises by opening with the compromise position rather than opening with the genuine article and then being, you don't want to sort of preemptively surrender the ideal version. <laughs> Boy, do I hate that. Yeah, right. That's like the, the terrible thing to do. Um, and so it's almost as though there's sort of two, it's almost like we have to have sort of two distinct conversations in a way. One is the, the internal conversation among advocates. Like, what do we really want to have happen, right? Uh, and then, and, and what would we, you know, frankly, among ourselves, what would we be willing to compromise with as a sort of a way station on the way there? And, and again, that would be the internal conversation. And then on the external, just don't let the other side know <laughs> that you would, you know, what you'd be willing to compromise. Because if they know that, then you really are basically Obama with the ACA in 2010. And so that's the, that's a, a kind of tactical, I suppose, dilemma that we're presented with when it comes to sort of how to advocate, how to push um, for uh, the vision. My own feeling at the moment is, you know, again, this might sound too, I know, mealy mouth or something, but I think it's, it's, it's quite exciting in a way that there's something like eight or nine, maybe 10 distinct uh, national investment bank type proposals before Congress right now. Lots of different Congress yeah, members. Yeah, it's, an ama it's amazing how many are being discussed right now. Um, and it's also amazing how ready people are now to talk in terms of trillions of dollars, whereas only six months ago, they were kind of afraid to go anywhere beyond billions and sometimes even to go beyond millions, you know. So all of that is really great progress. And I think that something yeah, is good. great progress, but with the change in parties now. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Republicans, of course, are going to be going back to the same old rhetoric. Right. Right. Well, power. So all we're yeah. going to be hearing about is billions of dollars now. So yeah. Maybe. Possibly, yeah. Maybe. I mean, I, Biden, Biden does seem pretty committed to spending at least two or three trillion on serious public investment. Um, and I'm, I've been sort of impressed by the fact that he keeps repeating that figure, even when, you know, other people talk in austerian terms or talk about how, oh, you know, we're going to blow out the budget or whatever. He seems to keep coming back to those numbers. And so I'm, I, that, that's not, of course, proof that that's what he's going to do. Um, so this is a bit off the topic, okay, mm -hmm. but um, have you any feel for um, how do people um, on Biden's team feel about uh, Stephanie Kelton's book? Yeah, so I think that um, this is really, it, this is one of the things that's really absolutely extraordinary in a way. And it, it, it's hard for me to figure out for sure, you know, what the ultimate implications are. But so like a lot of fellow progressives, when Mr. Biden announced that he was going to try to work some kind of a synthesis, right, find some kind of a an inclusive team that um, had was sort of equal parts Bernie Kratz on the one hand and more kind of Clintonite types on the other. I, I was, that. you know, sort of skeptical. I mean, not not like, I mean, I wanted to I wanted to give given the benefit of the doubt because you know he turned out pretty quickly to be a better person than I had credited him with like a year ago. So I thought. I don't want to be too dogmatically suspicious because I've been wrong about him before and maybe I'm going to be wrong about him again. But I was, let's just say I was, you know, kind of, I took it with a grain of salt, let's say. Um, and then I thought, you know, the more he did that kind of indicated that he was serious about that, I could still kind of add a grain of salt by saying, yeah, but it's not November 3rd yet. He wants us to, um, as you might remember or might have known, sometime in October, a rumor began to circulate in some of the financial press 
that even I was being considered for some positions at Treasury or the Fed. And I thought, first of all, that's like actually, totally, actually I did not know that. Yeah, it was really funny. It was hilarious. It was, and I thought, well, first of all, it's wildly implausible. But secondly, even if the rumor is being somehow generated by people on his team, it's probably just to send signals before election day to fellow finance finance oriented lefties that yeah you see he's really serious and open minded you know um, like I was like the poor man Stephanie Kelton right he wouldn't go that far there wouldn't be any rumors that Stephanie might be appointed to something but but maybe that guy you know um, but then what was sort of interesting is all that stuff kind of continued after election day and even after he was declared the winner I mean those rumors on the one hand. And the continued formation of teams that included lots of Bernie Krat types, along with the more sort of um, um, you know kind of mainstream types, so that has me thinking that he really is trying to do this. But I also think, and I, I actually did have some hope that I, I was thinking I could imagine Stephanie being at least a member of the Council of Economic Advisors or a I member. Was, of the I was thinking that too. Yeah. I thought it was completely implausible. You know, some people were saying, he's your neighbor for treasury secretary. And I thought, well, that's just ridiculous, right? There's just no way Joe Biden is going to name uh, Stephanie Kelton as treasury secretary. Um, but I, and, and I didn't even think it was plausible to think that she'd be named as chair of the CEA or the NEC. Oh, no, I didn't think so, too. I was, yeah. I was expecting if she got on, it might be because the chair, okay, was Jared Bernstein. Right, exactly. Because he's, he's genuine. To me, he had a shot at the chair. It's, I, th I thought so too. I thought he had a good shot at it. And I thought it was more than plausible. I thought it was even, I would say, I was thinking of it as sort of mildly probable that Steph would be named to membership on one of those teams, right? That she'd be a member of the CEA or the NEC. So the fact that she hasn't been named to either of those positions has is sort of telling me that maybe I was a little bit over sanguine uh, about his. It's a little discouraging. Yeah, it's a little bit so, right? It's not as bad as I thought it might be. I mean, you know, my, my preference for Treasury Secretary would have been uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin, but but Yellen is is okay, right? You could have done, he could have done a lot worse than Janet Yellen, let's say. Um, and then similarly, when he did name the CEA and the NEC people, I thought, you know, Lisa Cook is 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 fantastic, right? I mean. There, there is, um, there's much greater uh, racial diversity and gender diversity on both of those teams as well as other teams than I think we've ever seen in an administration before. So I, I want to give him credit for that. But at, on the other hand, none of these people are particularly heterodox, right? I mean, unless you consider paying attention to inequality and to gender uh, wealth gaps and racial wealth gaps heterodox, but I, I don't think that's heterodox. That's, that's orthodox, but asking questions that Larry Summers type orthodox types just never gave a fuck about, sorry, never gave a damn about because they're just like, okay, you say that <laughs> but you know, I mean, so, you know, uh, two and a half or two and three quarter cheers for these teams for their interest in, again, inequality and in particular racial and gender wealth gaps and, and disparities of treatment and opportunity um, uh, across genders and across ethnic groups. All of that is, is wonderful and to the good. But I don't think any of it is methodologically heterodox. Right. Um, what would have been methodologically heterodox, of course, would have been to name somebody like Derek Hamilton or Stephanie or, or both uh, to one or more of these committees. And I thought that that might happen. I thought at the very least, you know, that Stephanie might be the token heterodox economist or Derek might be. And didn't happen. So I'm thinking now I'm still pretty optimistic in the sense that. I don't think I was completely wrong in thinking he's kind of serious about trying to work this synthesis between the Bernie Krat Dems on the one hand and the and the old mainstreamers on the other. But I don't think he's going quite as far in that direction as I was hoping. Even and, and that's even given the fact that my best hopes didn't see Stephanie's Treasury Secretary or chair of one of these committees. My best hopes were to see her just being on them. Well, but too. but she's not, you know. So you know, uh, I'm, I'm still holding my breath, you know, waiting to see what's going to happen, like with Rahm Emanuel. I, I pray that nothing, that he doesn't get appointed anything, unless they make him the warden of the prison that they throw Donald Trump into. I'd love to give him that job. Um, but uh, you know, let him be the prison warden at the prison where they throw in the Trumpazoids. 
but other than that, I can't think of anything that uh, Rahm Emanuel should be doing in this administration. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Except staying far away from it. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Avoid <laughs> avoiding it. I mean, again, if if it if we're gonna like if we need guards at Guantanamo when we send the Trump administration down there, and they want to make Rahm Emanuel a prison guard. That that might make sense. He seems like he, he's kind of cut out for that kind of role in a sort of sadistic role. But 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 anything <laughs> anything more respectable than that i think is just you know not for him you know and you know I, I was you know like like all of our fellow progressives um i raised an eyebrow at the near tandon announcement um <laughs> but but i thought at the same time i thought you know maybe it's it's probably a mistake to fixate on individuals as distinguished from teams and i thought well given the choice um you know the choices of ms rouse and Ms. cook uh on on the economic teams uh, and given the fact that Jared has a prominent role on those teams, and given that Janet has been chosen as Treasury Secretary, if you think of Neera Tandon as sort of just being one within that broader grouping, maybe it's not the not our favorite um, uh, <laughs> component of that portfolio. But in one sense, I think that she's a sacrifice to the Republican gods anyway, isn't she? Because that's I probably right, because they've, they've already said that they're going to... It's funny too. I mean, I, they, apparently, I guess it was last weekend they reported that you know she had gone and erased like thousands of tweets or something. You know, and they say, "Do you really? Do you really? You really? <laughs> you really think those haven't already been read?" <laughs> uh, you know, and there is uh, such a thing as the Wayback Machine, also. There is that, right? And she's, 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 she's made her reputation with these people, and um, you know, my own. For, for what it's worth, I mean, my, my own thought about that is if, if she if she distresses Republicans, I'm thrilled. <laughs> what, what, what bothers me, of course, is, you know, she's on record with all that austerian nonsense in the past. And and of course, she seemed to have been really all about baiting uh, birdie crats um, on Twitter for a long time. She seemed to be more, I guess, um, you know, zealous in her attacks on Bernie than she wasn't any Republican, as far as I could tell, back in 2019. Um, and I, so I want to say to these Republicans, you know, if we can, if we can deal with it, uh, <laughs> you, you should, you should be able to as well. But you guys are snowflakes, of course. So, um, so to get back to the end, <coughs> right? <laughs> would uh, would Biden then um, uh, say we assume that he doesn't have people inside? Who are going to push for things like the uh, the job guarantee, right? And really, really huge continuous deficit spending, right? Um, and yet, he still has a need to get uh, the green stuff done, and he seems to be serious about that. He seems yeah. to realize that the climate threat is really real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something has to be done about that. Yeah. Is he likely to turn to something like the NIA to fill that gap without having to rely very much on the Congress? In other words, if he gets through one big bill establishing the NIA, he can get an awful lot done that way. He could get a ton done that way. Um, but I frankly, if you, if you want my sort of honest prediction, and I, I hesitate to make yeah, it because – <laughs> well, sometimes a prediction can have a kind of self-fulfillingly prophetic quality, so I sort of hesitate to make the prediction. On the other hand, I'm not important enough or listened to enough for my predictions to be heard enough to become self-fulfilling prophecies, and so in that sense, I won't yes, worry. I, I share that. You know, yeah, there's not a whole lot of not a whole lot to worry about here, right? But, but if you, if so, if I were to give my a, a kind of uh, standoffish assessment, a kind of a, an objective assessment ignoring any dog that I have in the fight, so to speak. I think that what would be most likely to happen, or what's most likely to happen in the case of the Biden administration, is they start out with the sort of the NIB component of the NIA, the more familiar wing of it, so to speak, the, the, the least or the less exotic or the, the less sort of unusual or surprising uh, looking part of it, because that's really... It's, it's easy to explain it in somewhat more familiar terms because it's more like an infrastructure bank proposal or a green bank proposal. 
And then I can imagine what would happen next would be assuming that everything kind of goes well, that the investments begin to pan out, the economy really begins to roar back because there's serious public investment in the trillions of dollars and the, the vaccine has been more or less vanquished and so forth. And then suddenly we find ourselves in a sort of an economic state somewhat reminiscent of that of the late Clinton years, like 1998 or 99. Remember when Clinton started toying with the idea of investing social security money in the stock market or oh, yeah. investing government? I think, in a sense, when you're anytime you enter into that kind of that kind of state where you've got kind of budget surpluses showing up or you've got significant public revenues coming in, then I think the Nicky Mac type stuff looks more plausible too, right? Because you sort of think, well, gosh, there really is a lot of public capital accumulating now. And maybe we ought to have something like public capital management understood as something other than mere infrastructure investment, but something bigger and broader, sort of with a, a larger number of functions involved in that. Um, and so what I could easily see happening is, in a sense, one half of the NIA gets put into place early on in the Biden years in the form of the NIB. And then again, everything goes great guns. And then when uh, Biden is ready to start taking a victory lap, kind of like Clinton was after he got over the impeachment hurdle, and he's sort of looking farther ahead in a more visionary way, he thinks, or they think, hey, why don't we add that Nicky Mack feature now? Why don't we turn to public capital management of this kind? Uh, and now we can start thinking in terms not simply of a, you know, an invest a national investment bank or a green bank, or an infrastructure bank, but you know something kind of like a public flat rock in the way that Sally and I were thinking about the the Nicky Mac half of, of of the NIA being. I could see that maybe happening, um, but if you were to ask me, do, do I think it's likely that the full package, both NIB and Nicky Mac together, as sort of core component parts of NIA, getting enacted in one piece of legislation uh, during the early Biden administration? I'm not going to I'm not going to say it's impossible or anything like that, but I think the odds are fairly low just because and I, I don't I don't think I would have guessed that necessarily before the cabinet began to take shape. But what, now that the cabinet has begun to take shape and we see that the people he's appointing are not politically conservative, but they're somewhat temperamentally conservative. You know, they're not they're not like out of the box. They're not hugely out of the box type people. Um, given that. Uh, I think they're likely to be a little bit more cautious and less imaginative when it comes to the, the sort of new institutional proposals that they do. Now, again, I might be wrong, and I'd love to turn out to be wrong, and I'm certainly not dogmatic about this. I'm not, I'm, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm laying odds rather than right. like, like a firm prediction. You know? uh, but if something were to happen with the confirmation, okay, of near attendant. Yeah. And he had to put in somebody else, okay, at OMB. Oh, right, right. And that somebody was a more expansive thinker. Right. Uh, then and, it might be more likely. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's absolutely right. I, I think it would. it's beyond question that it would be more likely if that were to happen. I think the, the question then becomes, um, is there an expansive thinker that we can think of that Republicans wouldn't nix? I mean, assuming we don't, if we don't win both seats in Georgia, let's say, I'm I'm actually still optimistic that we're going to win those seats in Georgia, um, and if that's the case, he'll probably get tanned and through. You know, on the other hand, if we don't win both of those seats in Georgia, then he'll have to get somebody other than Tandon, probably. Well, he might not get um, um, Tandon through anyway if Bernie digs in his heels. Well, there's that. Yeah, it's a good I point. I can't have her. I mean, he could say, uh, you know, look, I just can't have her. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, choose somebody I mean, else. She has made too many enemies. Okay, yeah. Our group. And there's no way we're going to be able to work together. In yeah. Such a powerful position in the administration. I mean, he yeah, could go point. up to Biden and just say that. Yeah. Yeah, he could. I've even been kind of, um, I've been handicapping um, the likelihood that she makes the rounds visiting senators to make nice with them. And, you know, does she end up meeting up with Bernie and do they, you know, bury the hatchet or not? <laughs> I, I sort of doubt it. She has, to, she has to meet up with Bernie, right? Because especially if it's 50 50 in the Senate. Yeah, she'll have to. She's going to be the chairperson of the Budget Committee. Yeah. And then the question becomes, you know, would she be sincere and would he buy it? You know, um, and let's just say I'm not going to I'm not going to bet heavily on in favor of that 
proposition. <laughs> 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 it, you know, stranger things have happened, but that doesn't seem to be one of the more likely things uh, to happen. But yeah, it's a, you know, Joe, I keep thinking about this. Like, what would be? There are some halfway expansive thinkers who even some Republicans like. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of wondering about that too, like who might be a, um, a, a plausible replacement for Nira, who would be both a more expensive thinker and somebody Republicans would accept. Um, you know, as, as you know, uh, one intriguing case is, you know, I don't know whether he's, in, you know, how, how, what he's indicative of beyond just himself, but Marco Rubio and some of his staffers have shown a, a very pronounced interest in renewing industrial policy. Um, and what seems to have kind of pushed them in that direction is the recognition that China is doing industrial policy. And one of the reasons that they're out competing us so effectively is precisely that reason. And so they've produced a number of white papers over the last year and a half or so, some of them sort of explicitly naming China and sort of talking about formulating economic policy with a view to the competition with China others more sort of indirectly about China and more directly about actual industrial policy and actual public investment of a serious nature, you know. And, you know, I, I have the impression that there are a number of other Republicans that are beginning to think along those lines too, right? That, that basically he's not as much of an outlier on that as he could have been. And that raises the, the, the intriguing prospect to me of whether there might not be uh, a, you know, a plausible candidate for OMB chair um, who would be, you know, expansive thinking in the way that you were describing, um, but in a way that is sort of appealing to some of these, the small number of Republicans who are interested in reviving industrial policy too, such that you could get, you know, pretty clear majority uh, in favor, even if we didn't have a majority of Democrats in the Senate, right? In other words, there might be the question is, is there somebody we can imagine both Bernie and Marco Rubio voting in favor of? And in theory, there ought to be, right? Because some of those white papers, you know, they're citing people like Stephanie and they're citing Mariana Mazzucato and others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And so and, and these are Republican white papers, or at least they're coming out of a Republican senator's office. Um, he's a he's obviously a very weird case he's still this you know rubio still tweets in defense of trump every day which i i, I don't know how you sleep i don't know how you live with yourself when you do that but but it, it's, it's kind of odd that you have a guy who on the one hand is tweeting you know in defense of trump and on the other hand is you know has staffers producing these you know truly superb white papers um but leave he must have a split personality. Was, yeah, exactly. I was going to, leaving the cognitive dissonance to one side. Uh, <laughs> if, if, yeah, if we can count on him uh, to continue to be intrigued by you know reviving public investment, and if again we can imagine him um, convincing a few fellow Republicans who are somewhat like-minded on that on that subject at least um, to go along with it, then there must be some candidate out there for OMB director who could appeal right to all the Dems on the one hand and then to those industrial policy repubs. Um, I'm just trying to think of who that would be, you know, um, Neil Kashkari, I don't know, some, you know, some, some sort of, you know, regional Fed bank president who is good at schmoozing with Republicans as well as Democrats because it's the Dallas Fed or it's the St. Louis Fed or something, or who might it be? Um, I do, you know, of course, if, if they're really good at schmoozing with Republicans at, let's say, the Dallas Fed or at the, you know, one of the other Western Feds, um, would they be expansive thinkers? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, you know, I guess what we're looking for is a kind of a Herbert Hoover, a young Herbert Hoover, aren't we? Uh, somebody who's kind of a Republican, but a, a young, dynamic, um, not particularly ideological Republican uh, in the way that Hoover was in his earlier days, you know. Um, yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, uh, uh, like most are, people you know, have been thrown out of the party. Most of them have. Um, and if they haven't, a lot of them have also just left it because, you know, just in disgust or embarrassment. I've been kind of wondering, you know, at this point, it's hard for me to think of that party as anything other than an organized crime ring, right? I mean, it just doesn't seem very hard for me to think of it. Also. Yeah, it just doesn't seem like an actual political uh, party. Like a weird something between a cult and a, and a, and a kind of like Cosa Nostra for 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 reactionaries, um, 
And so I, I was thinking, what would I do if I were like a Republican who was saying, what would I do? I mean, I suppose I'd try to revive the Whig party or something. Just say, you know, well, that was fun while it lasted, but it really, you know, it only lasted as long as Abraham Lincoln. It's been kind of downhill ever since. <laughs> so let's go, let's, let's revive the Whig party. Uh, well, what they have been doing, of course, is uh, joining the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah, as oh, kind of moderate them. Yes, and they've, uh, they've now penetrated very, very deeply. Uh, yeah. The Democratic Party, um, as you know, yeah, and this over a long period of time is now creating a split um, um, inside of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Well, I've often uh, thought about uh, what would happen if the Democratic Party could put, could um, somehow arrive at an agenda, okay, or at a, a series of appeals that would really knock the Republican Party for a loop um, for a little while, yeah. as it has happened um, during the 30s. In that kind of situation, would the Republican Party simply disappear mm -hmm. and the Democratic Party then split into its two wings? Yeah, and I can see that. Sure about that. Yeah, no, I've had a similar thought, Joe. It's funny, our, our minds seem to be kind of moving or seem to move in the same, along the same uh, tracks. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I was, I was thinking this as well, that the, the, it's so hard to tell the difference oftentimes between the kind of Nancy Pelosi type Dems on the one hand uh, and the once respectable Republicans, you know, this kind of Howard Baker or Bob Dole types on the other hand. You know, sometimes I think it's hard to tell the difference <laughs> Between um, Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, even, it's even that bad at times. And if we were talking about Dianne Feinstein, there'd be no question. I mean, Dianne Feinstein is a conservative Republican. Uh, how she manages to pass herself off as a Democrat is anybody's guess, uh, certainly beyond me. But but so what that's had me thinking sort of similarly to you, that you can imagine um, in a way we return to something like what we were in the 70s, where the Republicans were basically a moderate party, moderately conservative party with, with people like Reagan viewed as like the extremists in the party. Um, and then the Democratic Party, you know, was a big tent still, but you, you know, basically even the farthest right Democrat was way to the left of most Democrats now. Um, and the current Republican Party just disappears. It's just like a weird fringe cult, right? So it just gets bumped out altogether, and you basically just have conservative Dems and uh, progressive Dems. <laughs> and the conservative Dems are basically functionally equivalent to the old moderate Republicans. And I don't know what they would call themselves. Um, you know, I mean, some kind of a renaming, I suppose, would be in order because they probably wouldn't. Probably no moderate Dem would want to call him or herself a Republican, even if though, even though that's functionally what they are. Um, so, you know, but we might go back to the old two-party system thing again, and it might be in effect the same two parties that were in competition through the '60s and the '70s, um, but with just a di different names. You know, um, maybe the the Bernie Crat wing would say to them, the so-called moderate wing, okay, you guys can keep the Dem label, we'll call ourselves something else. Or maybe it'd be the other way around. Maybe the Bernie Kratz would be the Dems and the more conservative Dems would give themselves some new name. Yeah. But uh, but I think we seem to be heading towards something like that because the, the Republican Party, I just can't imagine it continuing to exist in this form. It seems to be imploding. It really is just basically operating on the fewer principles, right? It's just, a, it's just a cult of personality. Sometimes I think that if this last election had gone in a little different way, if Biden had run a more aggressive campaign, yeah. uh, there were 13, 14, 15 Republican Senate seats that were on the cusp of the yeah. time where um, the, those elections were close. Yeah. And the Republicans uh, won most of them in the end. Okay, and uh, you know the Dems picked up only one seat. Yeah, uh, and that was because of the campaign Biden ran, I believe. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. If he had run a more Sanders-like um, uh, campaign, he might have find have found himself with a 60-40 majority in the Senate. 
it's easy to imagine. I, I agree. I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the fewer people make this mistake than used to, but it's still an enormous number of people, it seems, who do make this mistake, who think that somehow or another, if you, you know, that somehow the the spectrum is a kind of completely linear thing, right? So the closer you are to Bernie, the more at the extreme end you are. And so the farther away you are from, you know, people over at this other end, but it doesn't seem to me like the spectrum is actually shaped that way. And, you know, it's... it's, it's Right. And it became kind of obvious. Um, I, I, I referred to it as a kind of a rock, paper, scissors um, arrangement back in 2015, 2016, because you had, um, you know, Clinton was able to beat uh, Bernie in the Democratic primaries. Uh, on the other hand, Bernie would have beaten Trump and in the nationals, at least all the polling suggested that. Yes, it did. And, and then Trump, of course, beat Clinton in the nationals. So it's total rock, paper, scissor, right? Each one uh, beats the one to her right and loses to the one to her left. And it just like it's like a kind of classic uh, Condorcet cycling, you know. Um, and I think in a way we're still that's still the shape of things, it seems to me. Right. I mean, there's in a, in a sense, it's kind of, you know, maybe it's not Bernie over Biden. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe it's not, uh, you know, Trump over Biden in the way that it was Trump over Clinton, but but he came pretty pretty worrisomely close, right? I, I mean, thought, obviously, yeah. I thought so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the margins were much slimmer than people had been predicting, um, and so in that sense, it's it's a little bit like it was in 2016, still it just just sufficiently different, thank God, to have enabled us to dodge the bullet of a of a second Trump term, but but. But yeah, I think that's sort of where it is. And it's interesting too, the thing, I think the thing that has enabled Biden to, you know, just to edge out Trump in the way that Clinton didn't is essentially those working class Rust Belt people. I think he got to trust him in a way that Hillary Clinton did not. And I think there are probably two, re three reasons. One is he's a man and some of those Rust Belt people probably do have a kind of a gendered way of looking at things. Another is he does, he at least did grow up in a kind of working class environment. He's not, he hasn't himself been working class for ages, but he still, that seems to be part of his identity to these folk. Um, and then relatedly, um, you know, he doesn't have the kind of baggage of having made a bunch of promises that he didn't keep that all the Clintons have, I think, with the working class, right? They promised the Rust Belt people that, oh, we're going to retrain you. We're going to find other stuff for you. And then nothing happened. And, I don't. I think Hillary was infected by that. Even even if she wasn't responsible, even if it was Bill who was responsible, she's just guilty by association, so to speak. Um, whereas I think Joe, you know, Joe managed to appeal to get some of those people back. The so-called, remember what was it like? Sixteen million, I think they said, uh, or was it? Am I thinking of sixteen percent? Sixteen. It was either sixteen million or sixteen percent of voters. They said um, who voted for Trump had voted for Obama. Um, which is a large percentage. For pretty it. telling, right? Yeah, that's a remarkable because it suggests that, sure, maybe those other 84% were totally racist and were, you know, deplorables or whatever, but 16% is a non-trivial chunk. And if, and those people probably weren't racist since they had voted for Obama. Um, and they voted for Trump just because, you know, they just didn't trust Hillary. And again, there might have been some sexism that was inflecting those expectations. But I think part of it was just Clintonism and not just, you know, not female Clintonism as such, but just Clintonism. My um, guess is those same people would have voted against Bill Clinton if he could have run in 2016 after having experienced him from 92 to 2000, you know. Um, he just didn't end up, you know, being what he said he was going to be. Uh, and, you know, one can debate, I suppose, to what extent he's responsible for that and to what extent he was just dealt a bad hand like Obama was in the form of all of these asshole Republicans. Um, he's kind of, you know, he had his Gingrich in the same way that Obama had his um, Eric Cantor. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, that argument uh, can really be made. I suppose I think that because of um, his attempts to privatize uh, Social Security. Yeah, 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 you're right. That particular deal was uh, with Gingrich. Yeah, and it, it did seem like the triangulation became an end in itself for him. Um, you could you could if you gave him all the benefit of the doubt in the world, you could sort of maybe 
last for maybe two years saying, okay, I see you're having to deal with this bad hand. This is the best you can do. But and then also during the Clinton administration, he started cuddling a lot with uh, Peterson. Yeah, Pete Peterson. And then that, uh, that, remember that Morris guy, I forgot. I always forget Morris's first name. But remember, he, Dick Morris. Remember, he hired Dick Morris. Oh uh, yeah, Richard. Yes, I do remember. Yeah, he yeah. Was terrible. And that, that, this guy was just horrible, right? And he, he, of course, later became a Fox News commentator, which kind of tells you everything you need to know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think you're right. Uh, completely a moral guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the cuddling with Peterson was about trying to cultivate. The contacts okay, of Peterson or Peterson himself yeah. in order to get those contacts in the private sector because I think Clinton was planning to move to New York mm -hmm. and cultivate contacts he needed to cultivate in mm -hmm. order to get really, really rich. Yeah, I can believe that. Carefully. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm in the past, I think I used to be extremely, extremely naive. I think in some ways I still am, but I think I used to be more so by far. And I still remember being absolutely shocked um, in early 2001, right before he left office, uh, when Clinton pardoned that Mark Rich guy. Oh, yeah. And I thought, what's the reason for that? I mean, there must it was so it was so egregious that I thought there must be something I don't know here. There must be some backstory. But there never turned out to be a backstory. Like people ask Clinton, "Well, why did you do that? What's the what's the backstory?" <laughs> you know, presumably there's some something that explains this, something other than just pure corruption. Uh, and he didn't have an answer. He just said, "Well, you know, that's politics." That was his answer, and that was like totally. You know, I was kind of depressed for about a month after that because I thought this guy really is just a crook. I mean, he's just basically been a criminal all along. You know, I didn't even know it. I really thought, you know, I thought he meant well. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I figured all of the bad stuff he did, uh, he was doing it either out of a misguided belief or out of a savvy belief that he had to do this to kind of work with Republicans in order to get anything done at all. Um, and that if he was wrong about that, it was at least a good faith mistake. And then all then that, that Mark Rich thing happens. And I think maybe none of that was good faith. Maybe the guy is just basically, you know, just, just some just horrid cat. Be a crook. <laughs> yeah, it's totally just a criminal, you know, just some bloody criminal. And I've, so I've never really been able to, uh, you know, trust him ever since then, you know, because I thought if I, you know, you don't really actually deserve the benefit of the doubt if you're the kind of person who would just pardon this total criminal for evidently no reason. And, and if there's no reason that you can give, then it has to be an embarrassing reason, right? It has to be something illegal or something that sounds in corruption, you know. Uh, uh, to uh, shift back to the NIA, oh yeah, mm -hmm. roundtable. Sure. A minute. Uh, there's one important issue I think that we haven't uh, actually discussed. Uh -huh. Okay, and that was the issue. It was brought up by um, 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 actually Mark Paul. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, some of the others. Okay, as well. Um, hinted at it. Not mm -hmm. in. You know, as explicit a way, okay, as yeah. we called it. Uh, but he was very concerned about the uh, the democratic element in the yeah uh, the um, NIA, the, um, the small v democratic element. Right. Yeah. How would the influence okay, of the people uh, that were being affected by the NIA? How would their influence be felt? in the choice okay of projects yeah in the setting of the direction yeah of yeah. uh the uh the nicky mac right um, investments yeah okay, yeah so uh the uh the loans okay, of uh the nib mm -hmm. national um, investment bank mm -hmm. so I i'm not sure that part okay, of your design uh, was quite as explicit about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I think in, in a way that's the, I think both Sal and I would agree. I mean, I can only speak for myself for certain, but I, I think I, I think I'm speaking for both of us and I'm certainly speaking for myself 
um, when I say that, that that has been, uh, to our thinking right from the get go, the hardest question in a sense, right? In the sense that it's the most obvious pressure point or the most obvious point at which certain tensions would be felt, right? Or be experienced, um, and where pressure would be exerted, right? Um, basically the, the worry is, you know, can you mix public and private? in a manner that really guarantees that the public stays in the driver's seat, right? So the, the kind of the glib way we described the ambition, um, and I say glib because you have to sort of, in a sense, to you have to kind of put your money where your mouth is with actual institutional design, which we, we definitely tried to do in the really longer paper. But but the glib, and, the, the glib way we would put it would be, we would say, you know, the, the, the so-called public-private partnership or 3P is a, a familiar model, at least it's been kind of, faddishly trafficked in for 20, 30 years now. It became kind of popular during the Clinton years in particular, no surprise there. Um, and But the problem with the sort of the standard model in our view was that it basically meant, you know, when we were talking about partnership, it was really public capital being managed by private managers, which is just totally perverse. Why would you ever do that? Unless you, <laughs> unless you were about to pardon Mark Rich, right? Um, <laughs> So, of course. Right? Yeah. So, so what we would say is that, would do that all the time. Yeah. So, so what we what we would say is we'd say, well, our our idea is to flip that, of course, where it's private capital um, being managed, uh, being managed with public capital by public managers. Um, the public managers, you know, are in the driver's seat and they make all the decisions, the determinations. So this is not so it's 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 almost to the point where partnership is the wrong word because it's not like private sector parties are are helping making the decisions or anything of that kind. They're just offered some additional investment options that they currently don't have, something that offers higher yields than treasuries, but that's still safe, kind of like treasuries, right? Yeah. Sort of the way that agencies are 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 today. Um that's the glib answer, but it was, you know, I don't mean to denigrate it by calling it the glib answer. It's just, it was the short answer, right? Um, it was glib only in the sense that it was short in the sense that in turn that, you know, you have to sort of further elaborate. And one of the things we really liked about the big paper, the, the sort of the original font of all of this, um, the, the kind of the or paper for all of this, which is again, the 2018 one that was published in the Journal of Corporation Law is we spent a lot of pages. We, we spilled a lot of ink on basically trying to design things in such a way as to minimize that particular risk, right? But, you know, uh, we are dealing with human beings here and, you know, how fully you can insulate against it um, simply mechanically through institutional design um, without also having to rely on just some good old fashioned human integrity yes. is, a, you know, it's a, it's a live question. And, and, and by the way, um, even our our favorite darling prototype, the RFC, is you know kind of notorious in some ways for I won't I wouldn't say corruption, but for anti democratic uh, characteristics. Yes. Right? yes, it was largely the personal fiefdom of Jesse Jones, who was a Houston banker, as you know, um, and he was a highly controversial figure um, among other members of the Roosevelt administration, for one thing but also among various Congress members and various private sector uh, folk as well. And, you know, I'll be, you know, to be quite frank with you, um, I would be very much against the NIA idea if I thought the only way we could do it would be to have another Jesse Jones. I don't think the country would tolerate that in a way that it might have been willing to do back in those days, partly because all politics was more backroom in those days, so people were a little bit more tolerant of deficiencies. Yes, backroom politics. <laughs> yeah, right. And Jesse Jones was the consummate cigar chomping backroom Paul type, you know. So you know, those were the days. You know, you know, we didn't even use primaries to choose candidates, right? I mean, basically, just party leaders just in smoke filled rooms decided who the candidate was going to be. Um, and we can't do that now. You know, that's just not that's not going to be. So, relevant. a further question for you. Yeah. Uh, when I was reading that part of the design and thinking mm -hmm. about it and seeing uh, some of uh, the, uh, the problems people were having with it, yeah. uh, the first thing I thought about was the job guarantee program, mm -hmm. actually Pavlina's version of it. Yeah. Okay. And specifically the idea in the job guarantee program that 
uh, the participants uh, themselves would have a voice in shaping the projects, yeah. finding their own jobs through yeah. the job guarantee program. Mm -hmm. and this would be done on a local basis mm -hmm. all over the United States at mm -hmm. the uh, 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 community level. So this would really tend to inject okay, a bottom-up element yeah. into yeah. the program. Okay. And I wondered whether something similar couldn't be structured um, inside of the um, NIA uh, with the recognition uh, um, as well that those kinds of uh, priorities okay, and preferences mm -hmm. would have to be integrated somehow mm -hmm. with the overall framework of the mm -hmm. direction of investments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. inside of uh, the uh, um, um, inside of the Nicky Mac mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would not be an easy thing. Where no. People needs, uh, we're meeting the trends. Mm -hmm. But if those two things could be integrated, yeah. it seems yeah. to me that would be the answer to uh, the problem. Okay, the no, it's, like, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually struck by how, yet again, I mean, we do, we, you and I seem to think very much alike, Joe. Um, so the, the the sort of biggest effort that I've had underway in connection with the Green New Deal uh, since basically since last summer, starting in 2019, basically summer 2019, um, is something that I've been uh, calling the the Green New Deal Binder Project, um, or also the Green New Deal Wish List Project. So the the idea is basically this, and, and, and you'll I think you'll see a striking similarity uh, between what I'm about to say and what you just described. So the thought that I had starting uh, basically right after we got over the hump of all of the hoopla around the release uh, or the submitting of the Green New Deal resolution in Congress on February 7th of 2019, you know, there's all this sort of press to do and all these interviews to do on, on TV and so forth. And once things had kind of died down a little bit after a month or so, um, I started thinking in terms of like, what would the next steps be? And that's when I sort of started thinking about what I call the, the Green New Deal wish list project. So the idea was to lever our connection, all of our all of us Green New Dealers connection to the Sunrise Movement and our involvement in the Sunrise Movement. Um, I was already a member of the Ithaca chapter and then also the New York City chapter. And every town and city in the country has a Sunrise chapter. And so our thought was, what we should do is we can, we can organize nationwide a, a, a bunch of town hall meetings, literally between city councils or within city council chambers, just involving interested local parties um, that would basically take the following form. You know, somebody says, imagine that the federal government were Santa Claus or just said, we're going to give you guys $5 million to work with. Um, if you have some greenification projects or some environmental abatement projects or some green infrastructure building projects that you have a, a need of, what would you spend that five million on? What would be your what would be your your top five choices or top yeah. ten choices of projects? And the thought we had that was that every town and city would come up with its own sort of wish list, and then we can collate all of these into one great big binder, so to speak. Um, and then when the new administration takes office in 2021, instead of saying, oh, we don't have any shovel-ready projects like Obama had to say in 2009, you could say, look, here's this giant binder full of prospective Green New Deal projects. Um, and this should be, this should all be a big, in, these should be inputs into our planning process when it comes to sort of designing and then implementing uh, the Green New Deal. Yeah. So it was, it, it's a little bit like participatory budgeting, um, a little bit like kind of fiscal ultra-federalism. Um, and the thing is something I understand actually very well because mm -hmm. I put together a design of, of uh, using that kind of, of methodology for um, organizations to use, yeah, I'm thinking okay of corporations and of uh, 
how they arrive okay at the priorities and mm -hmm. uh, a better way to do it so as to minimize the risk okay corporations mm -hmm. i wrote this down um, 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 okay, i wrote this down but uh, in my risk economics book oh good yeah yeah uh, which is one of the ebooks i have okay mm -hmm. on amazon okay i'll send you a copy yeah, do if you would. I'll send you my my the stuff that I've written on this too, Joe. We can compare notes. In fact, this uh, it's it's the timing is kind of nice. I did this um, this event with uh, Senator Markey last night uh, and a few co-authors to celebrate the release of a new book of Green New Deal writings. Um, and and my particular contribution to this book was is, is that the Binder Project. I've been doing a lot on that over the last year and a half. Oh, cool. So I'll, I'll send that to you, and you can send yours to me. I, it looks like it seems like we're thinking along the same lines. But I think if we did that, right? Um, if you have a kind of that, you know, ideally, if you if you think in terms of you know optimal role assignments, you know, higher, you know, at the, at the federal level. You know what are the comparative advantages? Well, one is of course the the unlimited financing capacity, right? The fact that you can just run really large deficits when when you have to, um, and then the other is of course you've got coordinative capacity, right? You've got a view of the entire continent spanning republic, and so you're well situated to make sure that projects aren't sort of at cross purposes with one another, and to make sure that there aren't unnecessary duplications. So you can do that kind of planning in that kind of macro sense. And then when it comes to the micro determinations of specific projects that need doing or that are most urgently in need of being done in particular localities, that's something that the localities themselves have a comparative advantage in. And if you basically, you know, developed the Green New Deal blueprint, so to speak, from you know both directions in that way, right? So you're kind of coming from the bottom and from the top in that way, and then they integrate in that way that would presumably offer you some insulation against capture by these industry group types not it wouldn't be foolproof but it would it would be one source of robustness you might say against that kind of thing it wouldn't be foolproof but what it would do is probably um, over a period of time it would probably facilitate the circulation of um, um elites so yeah be prevention against the formation okay of oligarchies in these yeah. um, organizations yeah plus the role that, that the fact that you're giving the fact that um people at the local level are not passive recipients of you know federally conferred public benefits but are actually active determinants or determiners of what those benefits are going to be, right? What the projects are going to be so important. means that you've got, you know, engagement by by stakeholders and they're not going to be, they're not, you know, they're going to be aware of the fact if Monsanto tries to interlope or if, you know, uh, British Petroleum wants to stick its nose in things, they're going to be aware of it and they're going to say, fuck you, you know, get out of here. Uh, in a way that doesn't happen if, you know, all of these decisions are made on high and the, the putative beneficiaries are all just passive recipients of the benefits rather than, you know, being involved in the actual determination and planning. So in that sense, you can kind of think of, at least the way I've been looking at this, and it sounds like it's the way we both look at this, is, you know, I've been thinking of this as being a, 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 a 300 million person participatory project from, from the get go. Oh, um, we really need that one. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And that's, I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I'm too young to have been a hippie, but I'm old enough to have had a mom who was a hippie. And <laughs> I, am, I imbibed a whole bunch of that participatory democracy stuff from her and direct democracy stuff from her. And, you know, I don't think I have any illusions in the sense of, you know, thinking that the whole country can be run on town meetings or something. But I do think that there's an awful lot of activity that can be kind of simultaneously macro and micro or simultaneously national and local. And it seems to me that the Green New Deal is like the ultimate in examples of this sort of thing, right? Because you, you can't possibly do it without coordination at the top, so to speak. But you also can't possibly do it without project determination at the bottom. Well, and you've so, got to have the buy in of people. Yeah, you need the buy in and you need to know what needs doing. Um, and again, if the idea, as you know, right, it's, it's right there in the, in the, in the, at the center of the original Green New Deal resolution that it's meant to be highly 
democratic and highly justice oriented and anti-racist. Uh, and we don't view those as add-ons. We don't view those as bugs. We view those as features. It's sort of part of the whole thing, right? I thought was, you know, in a certain sense, the, the original New Deal was in some ways supposed to be kind of like that, but because in parts of the country that were very, very racist, the implementation was racist, it fell short of its own sort of actuating yes. ideals in many ways, right? And I thought is maybe we can get it right this time because there seems to be a lower tolerance for racism and sexism than there was in the 30s and 40s where that stuff was just sort of taken for granted by lots of people, even when they weren't necessarily racist in the kind of deliberate sense of the word. You know, people I think were just were more willing to acquiesce in racism, even when they themselves were not racist. Sure, because they were just living in that cultural climate. Yeah, yeah. Get away and, from it. Yeah, and you know, one sense in which there we have made progress relative to that, even if we've gone way backwards when it comes to economic planning, you know, compared to the New Deal, we we have, I think, moved forward and 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 retained a lot of the gains when it comes to, you know, what forms of discrimination we're prepared to countenance and to tolerate. Um, we seem to be much less tolerant of that kind of thing now. Thank God. Um, so I think that make, gives us a chance to kind of get the New Deal right. As, as I understand it, you know, some of some of at least the the more idealistic uh, designers of or sort of overseers or pushers of the New Deal, like for example Henry Wallace, uh, the great left leaning vice president to FDR, they viewed it in, in highly participatory and localized terms, right? Um, and you know viewed it as a grand national deliberation and a kind of a an extended project it was not like one big three thousand page act like the dodd frank act or the affordable care act it was a a, a whole sequence of act after act after act over a 10-year period it sort of grew by accretion and it was all meant to be sort of democratically deliberated and determined sort of step by step and it was very experimentalist in the sense that if a pilot program worked really well, then they'd expand it. Uh, if it didn't work so well, they'd drop it and try something else. It was very, you know, kind of small B democratic and very, you know, small E experimentalist in that sense. But it was again flawed by just the fact that there was an awful lot of racism and sexism around. And I think we could probably get that democratic experimentalism thing done right this time, as long as we're mindful of it. Um, precisely because, you know, we're not going to be tolerating racist implementation or redlining or anything of that kind that kind of marred the original uh, thing. And again, I think getting back to your original question, just as you suggested, it's not foolproof, but this offers at least a partial insulation uh, against that kind of thing, right? Because it seems to me that these, these kind of capture type things or these kind of crony capitalist uh, incursions by private sector interests only work in the dark, right? I mean, they're basically, they're, they're like mushrooms, you know, they're, they're or they're like fungi, right? They only, they only spread uh, under cover of darkness and these kind of dank kind of wet corners. But if everybody's involved and everybody's a stakeholder and everybody's watching, it's a little harder to pull that kind of thing off, you know? Yes. Uh, so I think that that'll help. And then another thing has to do with, you know, just sort of effective governance design, you know, sort of uh, chains of accountability and, and auditing, um, uh, sort of scheduled auditing um, and various, some of those more familiar forms of safeguard as well. And it seems like if you combine those with the bottom up determination, then, you know, you might, you might get a pretty long way um, in preventing that kind of cronious uh, capture or takeover. Of, of the kind that I think Mark is entirely soundly uh, concerned about, as is our friend uh, J.W. Mason. Uh, John Mason's worried about that too. Yes, yeah. and I think for very good reason, right? I mean, it's 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 clearly the most. I mean, if there's anything that is like the like, if there's a single most daunting task that comes with a project like this, I think it's it's that, right? Um, and again, it's not with it's not it's not an accident, right? That some of the biggest scandals um, in American history have been associated with projects of that kind, right? A lot of them were sort of Jesse Jones related, but there were, you know, remember the William Dewar scandal during Hamilton's period, uh, yes. you know, um, it just, it comes with that territory. So you really have to be especially on guard for it. 
But one thing that doesn't seem to have been tried seriously as an additional antidote is I think precisely what you and I are talking about. This really high energy, bottom up grassroots involvement, because then there's the whole- It's happening. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah. yeah. That's also something we haven't tried in our political system. Right. Right. We don't like that in our political system. What yeah. We is to have uh, the elections okay, and the representatives, and we basically want the, the people to um, STFU <laughs> right. intervening period. Okay. Yeah. Election. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so we get the oligarchies uh, forming at the top. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, certainly yeah. Congress. Yeah. And they, you know, they only, they flourish in darkness, right? They, they only, they need, the, they need shadows in order to, to do what they do. And so part of what I think you and I are talking about effectively is just not allowing there to be any shadows, you know, just having the light shining all the time. Um, you know, one of my sort of mentors um, when I was a student is, you know, Roberto Unger, and he's known for a lot of things. But one of the things, one of his phrases or catchphrases that people sometimes chuckle over, but other times are kind of inspired by it, he talks about the need for a, a high energy democracy. Right? It's like basically everybody's constantly riled up. And, you know, I, I, I would sometimes laugh at him and I'd say, well, you're imagining a whole polity where every citizen is a Roberto Unger because you're basically a high energy guy, but you know, a lot of people actually, you know, they can only be on for, you know, maybe 10 or 12 hours a day and then they want to kind of calm down afterwards. And I think that what I, yeah, I'd say it to him and I, I think that was right, but, but there's some spheres of activity or endeavor where I think it's easier for people to remain high energy and remain engaged and not just want to kind of go and veg out. And I think this is one of them. If you're talking about rebuilding your community, uh, if you're talking about, you know, hey, we just, we're, we're, we're coming, you know, Santa Claus is coming in with a big gift of $100 million for you to revamp your whole community. I think that's going to keep people awake. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or at least there's some people oh, awake. Yeah. You know, we, we might work yeah, in. We're going to have a motivation to get excited. And yeah. Say, yeah. Know. Right. And even if we're working in shifts so that you're, you know, you're active, Joe, when I'm sleeping and then I'm active when you're sleeping. So there's there's going to be a kind of constant activity and a constant attention, I think, being paid, at least until all that money has been spent. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I think we can really have a very transformative uh, Green New Deal here that unfolds over the course of a number of years where you know attention is sort of sustained uh and where energy is accordingly sustained um and the more of that you have again the less shadow space there is within which crony capitalist types can kind of insinuate themselves yeah. okay all well, right Joe. this um, has been a joy that note yes this has been very enjoyable um i have something else to send you okay I have some links to three blogs I did some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, which deals with the problem, okay, of oligarchy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how we might be able to use um, 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 information um, technology mm -hmm. to put uh, in controls, okay, that would uh, counteract the iron law okay, mm. in our political system uh -huh. okay i mean i was thinking of it actually um from the standpoint okay of the iron law okay and by the way just to come back full circle <laughs> this the first person i'd heard about the iron law okay of oligarchy from was actually ted lowey no, ted lowey I, I knew you were going to say that I, yeah. I might know. I might know. so we are full circle that's great yeah yeah, I remember his Iron Law. <laughs> uh, but he was really into the Machiavellians. Oh, he sure was, yeah. Incomplete yeah. Conquest was the subtitle of his book, remember? Yeah. American Government, Incomplete Conquest. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'd love to, let's let's uh, let's trade papers, Joe. It sounds like you and I have been uh, flying a lot of the same territory. Um, and if you uh, well, um, um, I've read uh, some of your papers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, actually, okay. In preparation, I did okay a few live streams mm -hmm. about 
uh, the round table, okay, before mm -hmm. we convened uh, tonight and mm -hmm. uh, for those live streams, okay, I went through uh, the white paper mm -hmm. and also the more detailed. Good, yeah, yeah. Paper as well. So I'm, I'm fairly familiar with those, okay, at this point. So we can talk about them anytime. Oh yeah, no, that's great. We'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch about that stuff. Um, and then we can kind of trade some other papers as well, uh, maybe more on this participatory stuff in particular. Um, and yeah, it sounds like we'll have a lot more to talk about going forward. Uh, yeah, most of the stuff that I've written of late, okay, uh, uh, actually relates to, uh, to MMT things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I still think, I think that I'm still the only one who has a book out on uh, the trillion dollar coin. Oh, point. right. Right. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. So I'll look at, I'll look at those too. Um, we'll have a lot more to talk about. Okay. All right. Thank you, my friend. You have a great evening. Have a great night. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay. So folks, uh, we're here. Uh, let me try to get to a few of your comments. I just had the thought I might uh, take them on, okay, in writing. I don't think I'll have time to go through everything here, but I think I'm just going to pick up on uh, um, some of the comments uh, just to get a few things clear that uh, some of you may have found to be confusing. Kay says, my question is, could a GOP government uh, shut it down uh, 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 years from now like they did the old uh, state ho uh, hospitals? Yes, that can always happen Okay, if the GOP government has enough support okay, in Congress okay, and enough support um, 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 in the Fed. But to shut something like this down... I think the need for it would have to um, have weakened um, over a period of time. Like they shut down the Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1957. So it had lasted for um, a four a quarter of a century. The reason why they could shut it down in 1957 was because the private sector was really resurgent and growth was very substantial um, in the United States. 1957 was the height, okay, of the Eisenhower period, and uh, people didn't feel the need for the kind of institution that the RFC was. And so that's why they ended uh, the RFC, okay, at that time. And also the RFC's functions had changed, okay, because of the wartime focus of it, and then the post-war period uh, focus and the appearance of other institutions that were performing similar functions. So something like that, okay, could happen again. But if we developed, okay, an NIA, and that would to serve us for a quarter of a century and get through the Green New Deal, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Okay, and perhaps we'd be wise enough 25 years afterwards not to shut it down, uh, remembering the history. Okay. So, we don't have a single player who said that this is what we have to do. It was, duh, maybe wash your hands. Deborah says, this is really cool. Thanks, professors. And Jeff Denton says, yes, they won't even let me drop a link on my own timeline. And he's talking about uh, Facebook getting blocked. My Facebook and Barbara Wernick says um, federal job guarantees. Yes, I'm sure the federal job guarantee would have a place inside of a Green New Deal that might in part be funded by the, uh, the NIA. Okay, and Mark Paul, by the way, who had the critical piece that we were talking about, okay, in the roundtable, uh, is one of the advocates for the job guarantee. He's been the co-author of uh, Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity in advocating for the job guarantee. Uh,
And Jeff Denton said, I think that I would rather live in an underdeveloped uh, little community than a globalist dependent uh, large city. If we don't learn to develop our own commerce and trade that isn't uh, 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 dependent uh, uh, on monopolies, we're going to end up like rats and a maze, or even worse, the poor Palestinians in Gaza. Um, also, Dolores Pierce says, Facebook won't let me do a watch party in a group okay, that I'm a moderator or share the pages. Isn't that terrible? Uh, Facebook is really strange these days. No wonder it's getting called a fascist book. Carmen asks uh, whether the U.S. has to depend on commerce and trade, although they're a monetarily sovereign nation. Uh well, okay, we depend on international trade okay, and commerce because uh, we don't do everything here uh, ourselves and we don't really necessarily want to do um, everything here. So um, international specializations do uh, have a causal role in encouraging trade, okay, and commerce. There's nothing wrong with trade and commerce uh, 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 in itself. It's just when you develop your trade and commerce in such a way that it uh, uh, subordinates uh, your own political system, which becomes a problem if you want to have your own political system be one which is democratically accountable that's the problem we've been running into with our commerce okay and trade that the treaties we've been making have been um, undermining uh, uh, democratic accountability have the potential uh, to undermine that um, 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 i have a book on that too or a couple of books actually. Okay, if you go to my website, uh, 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 one of the books on this okay, is Declarations okay, of Dependence, and it uh, discusses uh, the TPP and some of the, uh, uh, the other trade agreements that uh, but they were negotiating at that time, or talking about, okay, at that time, and their effect on our sovereignty, including our monetary sovereignty. And the other book uh, was one about uh, 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 who needs balanced trade, who needs balanced budgets, okay, is what it was called. And that looked at trade from a comprehensive, integrative sort of MMT uh, um, type of view, okay, of both. And the basic idea, okay, of that book is that both our domestic um, um, economic system okay, um, um, and also our international relations had to serve public purpose inside of the United States. And the book makes that particular case. And Matt says, so how would the NIA spend grants or loans? The NIA would spend actually using both uh, by grants or loans. <coughs> and also investments, uh, capital uh, investments as well. Matt says, with the doomsday clock ticking very close to midnight, I'm not sure we have enough time for this long-term strategy. Well, if the NIA were to be quickly established, it wouldn't be a long-term strategy. It would act fast to begin some projects, okay, to approve projects, and especially to support projects that had to do with such things as uh, drawing carbon out of the air. I'm not talking about necessarily um, heavily technical projects. It would be very supportive, okay, of uh, aquaponics uh, um, and uh, uh, all regenerative forms, okay, of agriculture, 
So it would be really very supportive of those kinds of green things. Carmen says, with all the COVID deaths, perhaps the clock has sprung back enough to give us the time. I'm not sure about that, but uh, I don't think we have any more time. We we have to, I think we have to get to net zero by 2030, not by 2035. For the first half of 2020, we were at 1.3 degrees uh, Celsius above the, uh, the benchmarks. The scientists are currently saying that if we're at 1.5 degrees uh, uh, Celsius, that in itself is going to be catastrophic. And two degrees uh, Celsius above the benchmarks that's climate crazy. Even 1.5 is going to be close to climate crazy. Cases I'm kind of skeptical about any government ownership, although I'd love the idea our government is way too corrupt. Well, obviously, Kay, but the problem is to change our government so it is no longer corrupt. And in order to do that, we're going to have to totally change our Congress. We're going to have to get other people in, and before they can be corrupted, we're going to have to cut out the role of money in politics. We're going to have to prevent it from coming into politics. We're going to have to destroy the ideas of money as speech. I've gone through some ideas about uh, how we can re-engineer our campaign finance laws so that they are beyond intervention by the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court won't be able to say money is speech and stop us from cutting money out of politics. We've got to do that. Barbara says, uh, really? Carmen says, I have that same hairstyle. Same hairstyle as who? And Barbara says, shing, shing, shing. Well, I'm reading everything now. I said I wouldn't read everything, so I'm not going to do that. And K says a small group of large corporations have captured the legislature, regulatory, uh, judiciary, and the treasury. Absolutely, absolutely. And Katie Porter pulled back the curtain on McConnell about corporate um, liability, absolvency, absolved, holding the economic uh, recovery bill hostage while people are dying. And that said, K. Clark Ryan, indeed, and even the Progressive Congressional Caucus, about 100 strong posture for their constituents, and then get right in line behind uh, Pelosi. And K. says, um, maybe it should be like a credit union. Carmen says, correction, double terms, damned, um, autocorrect. I think Team Bunn used a lot of those uh, rhetorical strategies to shepherd uh, the progressives to vote okay, for the lesser of two evils. I don't know if they did. I personally didn't find uh, um, any of their rhetorical strategies uh, to be successful in shepherding me. In other words, I could instantly see as soon as Biden was, uh, was nominated uh, that if I I was going to have to make a choice, okay, between the lesser okay, of two evils, and I had from the beginning been terribly afraid, okay, of Trump. I think it was due to Trump's incompetence that he wasn't be able he wasn't able to consolidate okay, a dictatorship in his first uh, four years. It was only because he did not have the persistence he needed. Okay, to do that. So I think we were very lucky. I was very, very frightened of Trump from the start, throughout his four years, very dismayed in how the Democrats allowed him to get further and further and further, how they failed to throw the book at him on um, impeachment. They handled that so incompetently. Okay, it was terrible. Uh, when it came time to see if we could throw Trump out, 
I had to be for it. There was no way I could vote uh, third party, okay, in the end. Not this time, not 2020. That's it. But even when Kelton was on Team Sanders, Sanders still kept talking about taxes, financing, government spending. Yes, uh, I really think Bernie made a big mistake in 2016, in the 2015-2016 campaign, not coming out with full bore MMT then not making it clear to people what the real facts of public finance were and then continuing to educate about it for the next four years even if he didn't win in 2016 and then and then running on it again educating about it again in 2020 if he had done that we would be much further along than we are today in conveying to the American people the basic core ideas, okay, of MMT. And then, if that had been done, it would have been politically unacceptable for this stupid group of bipartisan Democrats, okay, and Republicans to get up there and spew the same old nonsense about how they could only spend $908 billion uh, because they hate debt. Uh, they got to do something, but they hate the idea of debt, as Romney said. They hate the idea, okay, of deficits. It's fiscally irresponsible. We got to do it. We're being dragged, kicking and screaming to spend $908 billion. We can't possibly spend a dollar more. We can't possibly spend two trillion or three trillion because the debt. Don't you know? Even though we just had a two trillion dollar tax cut for the rich, even though we never worry about uh, what we spend on the military and all these other things, we have still left the ground fertile for these deficit terrorist idiots to come back. At the end of January, when Biden is president, and start to mutter and shout and scream about uh, the debt again and the deficit again, while they were silent about it through most of the Trump administration. That's going to happen. If it happens, it's going to be in large part because Bernie wouldn't take on that educational campaign. I think he made bad decisions about that. Bad decisions. Biden is still shunning progressives. I wouldn't say he's, you know, shunning progressives. It depends on what you mean by progressives. He's shunning the MMT progressives. Yes. He doesn't appear to be shunning the more standard types of Washington progressives. Like, for example, Marsha Fudge or Janet Yellen, who under some definitions might be considered to, uh, to be a progressive. Uh, that is, uh, she was a labor market um, economist who was always a for full employment. And then there's uh, Jared Bernstein, okay, who's on the CEA, okay, and Heather Boucher, who was uh, certainly normally thought of, okay, as a progressive, and all of these people I mentioned have been considerably left of center for most of their careers. Uh, so I don't think that he's uh, shunning progressives, but he's, he's shunning, it seems, uh, 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 he's shunning progressives who are um, um, heterodox um, economists including the MMT branch, okay, of heterodoxy. Yes. And that says, Biden is using identity politics like a shield for the oligarchs. <clears throat> yes, I know. Barbara says, right, this piece of crap, fuck Biden, he gets credit for nothing, fuck him, still hopeful, huh? Uh, K says, combine it with a postal bank. 
I don't think a postal bank would be part okay, of the NIA because the functions are so different, but definitely we need postal banking. We need also public banking in every state. They have to be part of the Federal Reserve System, all these. Matt says, I reject that use, cave heterodox. It makes it seem that the orthodox are those who are right and normal. Their beliefs are killing people okay, and making millions uh, suffer needlessly. Well, uh, the heterodox, uh, 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 that was a label that the people who were running counter to the orthodox took on themselves because they wanted it to incorporate a number of different schools, okay, of heterodoxy. In other words, the heterodox uh, economists are not all of the same kind, but what actually unites them is their opposition to the orthodox uh, economists. So they held conferences and they talk together, they exchange ideas and things like that because there needed to be a group uh, set up to speak the different kinds of non-orthodoxy. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we view the orthodox um, economists okay, as those who are the mainstream okay, of economics. But the heterodox people certainly don't view the orthodox as right, okay, and normal, only as mainstream. But we would certainly agree that their beliefs are killing people and making millions suffer needlessly. Bonnie says hi to everyone. Uh, Uh, where Nina is likely to run, in fact, I think she announced that she's running for Congress in Marsha Fudge's district. And Marsha Fudge, okay, Marsha Fudge has been offered the, the secretary, okay, of HUD position. Uh, but um, in the Biden administration, and I believe she's likely to accept it and to go in there and leave the Congress. So her seat would be okay an open seat and uh, so nina has thrown her hat into the ring i don't even know if she ever wears a hat but she's thrown it into the ring she is in the ring and she is running and that is wonderful matt says i love joe's optimism yeah i'm a curable optimist Kay says, Carmen Fudge got nominated for head of HUD, and if she takes it, then Nina might run for a Congress seat, okay, which would be wonderful. I think Nina has filed with the Federal Elections Commission her intention to run for Congress. I think that's the Ohio 11th is where she's running. And Matt says, perhaps Nina can bring some fight okay, to the Progressive Caucus. Jordan Sheraton certainly thinks so. He's on cloud nine about it. He says he she's going to give AOC a run for her money as the leader of the squad. And yeah, she certainly whether she's going to give AOC uh, um, 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 you know a run for her money, whether the two sisters are going to move forward um, um, together with all the other sisters, okay, I don't know, but I certainly think they're going to have a great old time together at the left of the Democratic Party making further inroads okay, into the Democratic Party. As some of you may know, there are now eight members of the squad. If Nina won, she would certainly be the ninth member of the squad, unless some of the progressives who are already in there, like Joan the Goose, for example, finally decide they want to join up with the squad. That would be very nice to see. And cases exactly, Mac, then, and what is that chorus of locust noises? I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Um, I've been wearing uh, some, uh, some earphones today because I wanted to make sure that when I was on, 
with uh, with Bob Hockett, uh, you didn't hear echo sounds or things like that. I think for the most part, uh, the sound uh, was pretty good, but occasionally we did have the cricket noises, as some may have called them. Deborah says, Bernie's too nice, yeah. Tandon cannot go through, Barbara says, sure. Yep, and Matt says, uh, you know, maybe Biden put uh, the Nira out there as a lightning rod. Yeah. Matt says, I'm sorry, I cannot take, uh, uh, but uh, I cannot take uh, 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 Senator Marco Rubio seriously about anything. And Carmen Muniz says, I call him uh, Marco Stupido. And Barbara Warnick says, no. Cases Bernie has been working with GOP Hawley, Josh Hawley, on the stimulus. And Barbara Warnick says, no. And Carmen says, seems they want to squeeze a $600 crumb for us. It still is not enough. Trump wants to squeeze out a $600 crumb, but he wants to take away the $300 per week of okay, unemployment for four months. It's not a fair trade. In other words... 300 a week for four months is uh, more than um, 1,200 a month. So that's trading $4,800 for $600. Of course, there are different people involved. There are often are different people involved, but there's considerable overlap between those people who would get a $600 check and those people who would have the $300 a week, okay, in unemployment. And none of those who would get this $300 a week, okay, in unemployment would want to have the $600 crumb. Instead of that, they'd have to be crazy. So this is just another attempt by the Trump administration to stick something funny in the gears. It's ridiculous. Matt says, oh my God, these stimulus bills are benefits only for the 1%. I mean, these stupid bills are we going to debate? Matt says, I think the U.S. needs to go the route of the USSR and break up. We need to break up the country to three sections for progressives, corporate centrists, Christian fascists. I don't know if the country okay, is breakable in that way. It would be breakable by region. I could see the whole West Coast essentially breaking off, okay, as a nation, perhaps adding Arizona, okay, um, 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 you know, and also Nevada. May be going as far east as, uh, say, New Mexico. Uh, I don't know where Montana would go. It seems to me Montana is awfully conservative compared to Oregon, Washington, and California. In other words, the political culture in Montana seems to be very different. In Idaho, it seems to be very different as well. So. I think the mountain states might, uh, you know, break off themselves. Uh, of course, the South. Now, I don't know where Virginia would go. I don't think Virginia is so Confederate anymore. I'm not sure where Georgia would go in that instance. There might be an Atlantic uh, the coast nation and a Midwest nation. I think we might break up into four nations. Um, if we broke up, we might not break up. People's Party are on the ballot, K in May now. They had a meeting the other night, K in uh, Colorado. And Nick spoke. And... Uh, I guess they're going to try to constitute now, okay, in Colorado, and go state by state. 
We're going to pretend, okay, that election fraud and voter suppression were not in effect in the Dem primaries in 16 and 20. No, we're not going to pretend that. Of course, there was machine election fraud. We know that because the exit polls were much too discrepant. We know the Democrats practiced that um, in the primaries. Those primaries came crooked. The main reason why we don't think they practiced that okay, in the general uh, election is because they didn't have enough control okay, of uh, the battleground states in order to practice it in the battleground states. And in the states that were not battleground states, there was no need to um, to commit election fraud because Trump wasn't going to win in those states anyway. So Matt said Biden's whole campaign was predicated on the fact that he was not Trump. Yeah, Matt says Clinton's a disgusting. And Matt said, what about his connection to Jeffrey Epstein? Disgusting. Matt said, what's so absurd? Yeah. And Matt said it started with Carter. Yeah, it did in a way start with Carter. I think Carter was a man of considerable um, integrity, but he bought into this fiscal responsibility shtick. I mean, it was terrible. If he had not bought into the fiscal responsibility shtick, he probably never would have been beaten by Reagan Okay, in 1980. I know one of the precipitate causes of his defeat in 1980 was the Iranian situation. But if the economy had been going great guns, that would have displaced him from the presidency. And if we had had four more years of an expansive Carter emphasizing alternative sources came energy and conservation, really aggressive environmental and climate sort cave platform, uh, we would have been much further along than we are today in getting off of fossil fuels. Whole history was changed by uh, the Reagan win, and that in turn was shaped by Carter's foolish positions and actions when it came to his so-called fiscal responsibility. Yes, it did pick up, it did start, okay, with Carter. I give a full accounting of this um, um, in my book on the progressive give up uh, formula. It's called real fiscal responsibility, the progressive give up formula, Matt. Matt says, we still don't use primaries to choose candidates. So Obama is a fraud, Dr. Joe is ahead of his time. Thank you, Carmen. No one seems interested in the subject matter who's commenting. Yes, we are, Deborah. I suggested the credit union and postal bank uh, connection. Uh, But you didn't suggest the state bank uh, connection. We need state banks, too. Matt says Biden has no interest in the Green New Deal. I don't know about that. I think Biden has an interest in the Green New Deal. I think he just doesn't want to call it the Green New Deal. (laughs) Because that was Bernie's idea. No, actually, it was the idea of the Green Party. They had the idea a long time ago. Matt Arado says the Green New Deal take a massive effort like the New Deal in today's uh, political environment. How could this happen? It could happen. It could happen. Take a big step towards happening. If Biden could sneak through a national investment authority during his time. After all, what is it about? It's about private investment, right? Okay, uh, you know, and it's about basically an infrastructure bank. That's what the NIA is. So there might be enough of the Republicans who would go for that. Like Mitt. I mean, Mitt, you know, might go for that. Susan Collins might go for that. Enough of the Republicans maybe would go for that that even if the Republicans had control of the Senate, if such a bill could get to the floor, it might pass. Certainly the election in Georgia is very important for this. Okay, yeah, people are getting um, evicted in the streets. 
And Matt says Robert has a very optimistic take on modern day America. Co-op federal jobs guarantee. I love it. Oh shit! Did someone break another seal of the apocalypse? Carmen laughed. COVID makes out in the streets hardened these days. Now Roberto Unger got to look him up. Right, people are working so hard to make ends meet. Um, 50M of food insecure. It is not easy to get politically involved. Food banks are running low. Shelters are paranoid. Take people in. Uh, um, somebody said thank you to me and Robert Hockett there. Oh, Robert said thanks so much, comrades. <laughs> Antonio Cowhouse said, uh, thank you, Robert Hockett. Thank you, Joseph M. Firestone. And Matt said to Carmen Muniz, 100%. Kay thanked us both. Deborah said, two brilliant minds, great talk, coin book. Carmen said, that idea was refreshing. Good night, Dr. H. And Matt says, uh, uh, Robert has some great articles he does. Okay, so this is really a great uh, discussion, Joe. We need more of these. Robert says, thanks so much, comrades. And Carmen says, thank you for the in-depth answer about trade and Joe, about trade and commerce, Dr. Joe. Sure, Carmen. Carmen says, thank you so much for coming, Robert. John Rooney says, uh, McConnell is a radical purple man who doesn't care about Americans. He certainly had purple hands. A few weeks back, didn't he? Susan says, great concert conversation. Thanks. Carmen says, love your short take about uh, Nancy Pelosi and confidence. Cream of the crop stuff. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really angry about uh, Nancy Pelosi. God, I'm angry. Carol says, thank you. Um, but Carol Coutinho, nice to see you again, Carol. Susan says, Ryan Knight was tweeting about MMT today and how everyone needs to learn it. Good for Ryan. The movement for a people's party. Moving in on MMT. That's wonderful. Carmen says, oh, my God, the demo did that. Talk about knives in our backs. Deficit, debt, garbage, Dems. What do you think about uh, Xavier Becerra for HHS? Uh, I think that probably Becerra would be open to, to allowing states to use the waiver clause in the Affordable Care Act to pass uh, to pass a Medicare for all system for their states while continuing to receive the federal money that states get for the ACA. So there are a number of states that have been, have had active movements in Medicare for all. One is Massachusetts, Vermont, is Minnesota, is Pennsylvania, is California. I think there's a movement in Washington and maybe in Oregon, too. So anyway, with Becerra as uh, the secretary of HHS, states who want to vote for that internally and to apply for it would get a sympathetic hearing. And I don't think Biden would block that. I don't think that he would block that. So I think it's hopeful that that part of the Affordable Care Act might be exercised. Of course, I don't see Biden going for Medicare for all on any time soon. But if we could get a Medicare for all system in, let's say, California okay, and Pennsylvania within, let's say, two years, and people really liked it, then a groundswell would sweep in other states too. 
and make it much more likely that a national bill would pass. Case says, I've heard both good and bad, Susan, but Newsom in California ran on single payer and he was uh, for it then. Yeah, there's a movement in California for single payer. Susan says, Krugman seems to be coming around to MMT. I think he's coming around to some aspects okay, of MMT, but I still think he clings to his loanable funds model. Um, you know, you begin to wonder if that guy knows any other model except for his little loanable funds model, his little toy model. <laughs> he loves to put uh, <laughs> on blogs in the New York Times. Jesus. Susan says Nina Turner is running. Yes, she is. Okay, says, did you get that notice I sent you about, uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, Nina Turner Joe. And the answer to that is no, K. I I did not get it because having looked at my messages on Facebook recently, because when I had Bob on, I didn't want to have any technical problems. So I shut down Facebook. I didn't have uh, Facebook on, even though I'm live streaming to Facebook now. I'm not actually looking at Facebook. And I didn't want to uh, to look at okay, Messenger uh, either because I didn't want to have any serious technical problems with Bob. And, of course, um, I didn't have any. Susan says, she's filed already. What is that CD like? Uh, yeah, Nina wears hats. Cute little fuzzy hat at that. Not some stupid pussy hat. <laughs> Kay says, yeah, Nina would be a leader in the squad. Yeah, Nina's going to be a leader wherever she goes. Squad, schmod, she's going to be a leader in the con whole Congress. Hello, somebody. Hope she hits McConnell in the jawbone. Yeah, me too, says Kay. Me three, says Joe. Carmen says, and I moved to the West Coast nation. Well, my daughter is living in California already. K says, maybe Washington State, but not California. Yeah, my daughter loves the heat in Southern California, so she really likes that. So I'm at the end, and I'm going to say good night. Thank you for coming. I think uh, this was a very successful live stream. I loved it. Thank you all for your comments. I think the discussion was a very successful discussion. Uh, I was glad to see Matt back tonight. And I was glad to see a few more folks we haven't seen for a long time. And that was very good. I was glad to see Deborah back. And the rest of you, of course, have been coming right along. So thank you very much for coming right along and for engaging and for commenting. And of course, I will see you tomorrow night. Don't worry, I will be here okay, at 9 o'clock. <laughs>